Hello everyone, welcome to Scotty on the Horn. This is a podcast where I invite experts from a variety of fields and discuss topics that interest me. Today's guest was Dr. Sean Brayton. He is an associate professor within the Faculty of Kinesiology and Physical Education at the University of Lethbridge. Sean's expertise involves cultural studies, race and ethnicity, popular culture, film and television, physical activity, and critical multiculturalism. A little bit about Sean, he completed his Bachelor's of Arts at the University of Lethbridge. He then moved on to do his Master's of Arts at the University of Alberta. Finally, he finished his PhD at the University of British Columbia before moving to the University of Lethbridge to become a faculty member. Sean happens to be one of my favorite people to chat with in the hallway at work. He's an incredibly interesting man, has a knowledge base that is just so deep on a variety of topics. <laughs> I hope you enjoy yourself with this one. We talk about movies, we talk about shows, sports, social constructions of the body, race, politics, and power. So you're in for a treat today. I hope you enjoy. So I like to start by having people talk a little bit about their sport history. So okay. Bring me back to uh, little Sean. He's oh, <laughs> he's, That's a long he's getting involved in sport. What do yeah. you play? Uh, well, once upon a time, I was into soccer as a tyke. Yeah. Uh, baseball. Love yeah. baseball. My baseball, brother yeah. veered towards lacrosse yeah. when lacrosse started becoming more popular, but I stayed in baseball yeah. until I was probably 13 or 14 years old. And it's been mostly hockey. Yeah. Hockey until I was 20. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. that was it. Nice. Where'd you end up? Where'd you play? Uh, I played in Calgary for Midget, Bantsman Midget. Yeah. So I played for the, they called it the Buffs, Calgary Buffaloes. Yeah. That would have been AAA Midget. And then uh, my junior career was spent <laughs> in uh, Victoria yeah. for a team called the Salsa. Okay. It was the BCJHL at the time. Mm -hmm. And they had a team called, they were an expansion team. We played in the old Memorial Arena where the Cougars used to play. The Cougars yeah. then went to Prince George, but I, don't know, I think they're still there. I think Char played for yeah. Prince George Cougars. Yeah. Anyways, Victoria Salsa was the team, yeah. expansion team, and the, the logo was a little, the mascot was a, a jalapeno pepper, <laughs> an angry jalapeno pepper with a stick. <laughs> and then I played for uh, the Kindersley Clippers in the Saskatchewan Junior League. Okay, nice. And that was the, basically the extent of my oh, career. Yeah. yeah. Did you still play at all? Or no, not at all. I watch. Yeah. And by the time I quit, I would, it, it became readily apparent to me that this was a business yeah. after a few trades. Yeah. Uh, and you, you become aware that you're a commodity and you're treated, treated like a commodity. So yeah. I'm not saying I was, you know, a, a <laughs> fully cognizant Marxist at the age of 20, you know, talking about commodified labor. But you get the sense that it's no longer a game and it's a business, right? Yeah. And I think different athletes come to those realizations at different stages. But for me, it was in and around 20. I just lost interest mm -hmm. and almost had uh, a bit of vitriol towards the sport because of my disillusionment, I think. So yeah. I didn't really, I, I've never played um, beer league or men's league or anything. I still, I, I coached for a while yeah. in terms of uh, like goalie coaching and private yeah, yeah. and did a bunch of hockey schools for a variety of yeah. NHL player. So that's the, that was the extent of my, I ended at 20, but I kept coaching and doing hockey schools until I was probably 27 maybe. Yeah. And now I just watch. Yeah. 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 When I left, I, I hated the game. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember I, I quit in playoffs in the last year, my last year we were in playoffs. Really? Yeah. And I hated my coach and I just walked away from it. <laughs> I was, I it's just, amazing. In the middle of people, a series. Yeah. It's, it's actually <laughs> amazing that more people didn't quit. Yeah. And I think that's owed in part to the indoctrination of young folks into yeah. the game of hockey, right? Yeah. yeah. It really is an institution, but it's one that is, and there are great coaches. And even yeah. when we played, there were some outstanding coach, coaches, mm -hmm. but the kind of iron Mike Keenan, that kind yeah. of yeah. hard ass yell at you, uh, verbally and physically abusive at times. That was, that was a de rigueur of the day, right? Yeah. yeah. Like that's, you just, you just, you didn't speak out against that. Yeah. Because you weren't really aware that you had any rights as a human being, right? You just yeah. internalized it and went with it. Yeah. So, of course, I mean, this isn't to say there wasn't, you know, resistance to the coach behind the coach's back. We were always talking shit about the coach. Yeah. If we didn't like the particular coach. Even if we did like the coach. Yeah. 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 But uh, the kind of front stage idea of, of the coach being the, the, the dictator. Yeah. I think that's changing now. And I think Hockey Canada has made some great strides into trying to weed out those 
bad apples is a terrible expression mm-hmm. because there, it wasn't a bad apple thing when he played. That was yeah. the that was the orchard. Well, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was the Mike Mike Babcock, right? So oh yeah, for sure. Year, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Now he's. Uh, I don't know how people are surprised. Like, <laughs> yeah. Really? That was bad talk? When guys like you and I are watching them, like, yep, of course. <laughs> yeah. Of course it was like that. No yeah. kidding. What's interesting though is if doesn't he have a master's degree in psychology? Yeah. Yeah. Not to say that uh, he should well, he's a maybe Miguel he should go too. So. Miguel guy. Yeah, I'm Miguel no, guy. I actually followed him. He was uh well he was in Freddie's office. So he went Miguel and then he, he was in Freddie's office? Yeah. He, Seriously? Yeah, he coached the the year that, that the University of Lethbridge won. I knew that. And knew that. Fred Trin has Mike Babcock's office. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, so I kind of followed Babcock. I yeah. did McGill, and it. then I wound up at University of Lethbridge. And then, uh, so you're Toronto-bound in a few years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. We're going to Detroit, and then... <laughs> and then my career. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hopefully you'll get a big contract. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you think he'll coach again? He'll pop up somewhere. Yeah. I mean, even Mike Keenan popped up in Russia, right? Yeah, yeah. I think he'll get, he'll make his way back. Yeah, I think he's probably, probably still an excellent front coach. I mean, he wins worth he goes. Yeah. yeah, front office. Yeah. Right. What about Todd McClellan? Where is he now? No, I no. would imagine some of these guys take, some of them jump right back into the fray. Yeah. But others realize that they've been paid for the next few years and they mm-hmm. can kind of, you know, chill out a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Like a sabbatical. Yeah. I mean, you kind of, we need that. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know if, Professional coaches need that necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you feel like if you get out of the loop, you're out of the loop, and yeah. you don't necessarily. There seems to be a learning curve when you get back into it. Maybe yeah. I don't know. It's kind of, I don't know either. So two ball. years of coaching in my belt. Oh yeah, that's right. You are a coach. Yeah. So uh, no season for the Thunder. Uh, no season. I, well, I think they're trying to get a, the- a season. Are you going to be in a bubble? <laughs> Is it going to be a Lethbridge bubble? No, I, are you I'm, a hub city? Yeah. I'm a, unfortunately I'm out now. I, uh, mm. You got the daughter, so yeah. <laughs> newborn yeah. coaching's yeah. done. Yeah, no more eleven. I'm probably gonna make uh, my uh, triumphant uh, start in the women's game oh, four yeah. years from now and coach. <laughs> there you go. Once our program's some, uh, what time it is? What time is it, Mister Wolf? For half an hour and then yeah. a little bit of skating. <laughs> so oh, that's a good game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember playing that. Yeah. That was my. A little bit of soccer too. Yeah, they run around. You say, so, "Don't touch it with your hands. Don't touch it with your hands. Don't touch it with your hands." Other way, other way, other way. Don't touch it with your hands. Yeah, <laughs> and That's then you funny. play. What time is it, Mister Wolf? <laughs> That's awesome. Oh yeah, yeah. It's twelve o'clock. We're in my garage. Uh, I actually have a for the first time in person, but we're trying to respect some COVID rules. So if you hear some stuff in the background, that's my neighbors. I'm not. Treating my, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make that little golf squad screen. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we talked a little about your sport now. So what about academia? What's uh, what's your story there? How did you get involved in academia? Where'd you go? Well, I knew that once I finished hockey, I had to. Uh, if I if I wanted to avoid paying rent, yeah, to my parents, I had to enroll in school. Yeah. So. In, I just sort of went to Mount Royal College one day with a friend and tried to enroll in a program that uh, would follow in the footsteps of my father, who was a social worker at the time. Actually, he was teaching at the college. Um, and then I realized that maybe I wanted to teach phys ed. Mm. So I started in Mount Royal College. as the, That was back when I was at college. Now it's a university. Right? Yeah. So it would have been the university transfer program, uh, probably physical education at the time. And then I got to U of L. And uh, still thought that I would teach. This seems to be a lot of, this isn't a unique story, I don't think, in the <laughs> sense that a lot of people start off wanting to teach phys ed, yeah. and then they realize that phys ed is actually a part of kinesiology. We can tease out the yeah. epistemology of it later. But the idea here is that, okay, phys ed is phys ed. Yeah. And then you get into this department and you realize it's so much more than phys ed. Yeah. So I had a couple of, I mean, I had some really outstanding instructors, but one in particular really stood out to me and introduced me to this idea that studying phys ed didn't necessarily mean sciences or physical education. It yeah. could be sport history. Yeah. It could be sports psychology in your case. Mm-hmm. It could be sports sociology. Did I say sociology? History. Yeah, yeah. the humanities and yeah. the social sciences. Yeah. So once I became aware of that, I thought, oh, this is really interesting. I'm gonna, I'd like to continue mm-hmm. to pursue this. His name was uh, Dr. Brown. Doug Brown. He taught... He did some stuff. I think Bonhoff knows him, actually. He did some stuff at the University of Calgary, or he was at the University of Calgary. Anyways, he was pretty inspirational. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you just come across people that 
that open windows and doors to new experiences and new ways of looking at things, right? Mm -hmm. So I took an interest in sports sociology as um, graduate studies. Yeah. So I, I met with, so I took all of my social science and humanities courses here yeah. for Kinesis, and then Dr. Brown left, and then a new sports sociologist came by who was here for a bit. Dr. Robidoux was his name, Mike Robidoux. Oh, Mike Robidoux. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I had a conversation with I didn't take any courses with him, but yeah. him and I had, a, had some conversations about uh, graduate, stu graduate studies. And he encouraged me to apply and work with a guy named uh, Dr. Gamal Abdel Shahid at the University of Alberta. He's so formal with the doctors. Yeah. Um, so I did that, but I didn't work with Gamal immediately. I eventually worked with Gamal. I went to U of A and then decided that I'd like to pursue a PhD so that I went to work with uh, Rob Sp Bob Sparks at UBC. Oh, yeah. And that's it. What was, uh, what was your master's thesis? My master's thesis was on skateboarding and race. Okay. So it was called, I think it was called something along the lines of Black Lash, Revisiting the White Negro. It was based on Norman Mailer's work. Okay. Norman Mailer wrote a short story called The White Negro, where he was sort of poking fun at the hipster, the white hipster, yeah. who was inspired by uh, this kind of stereotype of black cool, the habitat, yeah. right? So uh, my master's thesis was on skateboarding and representations of whiteness and how that overlapped with different historical Iterations of whiteness, particularly as it related to uh, Jack Kerouac and the Beats, for instance. So I looked at skateboarding media and thought, okay, there seems to be this interesting fetishization of blackness or street culture yeah. um, as it related to the politics of whiteness. But there weren't a lot of skaters of color in these magazines at the time. This is, you know, early 2000s, right? Yeah. I mean, there were a few, but not many. Mm -hmm. But there still seemed to be this, this fantasization of the street mm -hmm. and a racialized fantasy of the street that was cultivated, that was used to articulate a certain form of resistance and rebellion within the skateboard media, yeah. uh, magazines and, and videos. So that was my master's thesis. I had no idea. When I was in my undergrad doing, you know, kinesiology, I never dreamt. I thought, it, okay, skate, studying skateboarding, because I was a skater yeah, yeah. long ago. I never dreamt skateboarding would be a subject of serious intellectual inquiry outside of the biomechanics of skateboarding. Yeah, I never yeah, did yeah. I think, oh, yeah, you could do a sociological. Yeah. approach to, to yeah. skateboarding. So I did that for my master's. I think there's some similarities with snowboarding too. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. The, and and uh, the use of music too, right? Yeah. Hip hop and rap yeah. in terms of the, the music, the, the videos yeah. of snowboarding and skateboarding and the fashions as well. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's just, you know, the, the paradox, the racial paradox of whiteness and blackness in skateboarding is even more egregious insofar as it's still so overwhelmingly privileged mm. right i mean it costs yeah. so much more money yeah to snowboard than to skateboard but oh, yeah. there's definitely some, yeah. some, some well i mean i so i grew up in mont so i ski right. and snowboard town and if you don't know it about me i love rap music right so even the intro to my my uh podcast oh yeah gets nice. into it a little bit right nice. but yeah love 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 rap music and I remember, you know, it's got, it's got the baggy snow pants oh, yeah. down to the yeah, knees. And like, sure. yeah, the, the way that, that you dress, the music that you listen to, it was very, very much influenced by black culture. So I think my first major academic presentation would have been when I was a first year PhD student. It was in Tucson, Arizona <laughs> at the North American Sports, Sports Sociology Conference. And it was called Bringing the Hood to the Hill. Oh, yeah. It's about the use of yeah. blackness and the image of yeah. the, the fetishization of blackness in predominantly white snowboard culture. Yeah. 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 Well, all of us were white. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 For sure. So, definitely. Yeah. So, do you want me to reciprocate the questions as well? Do you feel like you're not getting any? No, no. I mean, you okay. can ask. Yeah, it's a conversation. So, if yeah. you want to talk, yeah, yeah. if you want to ask questions okay. about it too, I was going to ask you is it problematic or is it sort of, are there, pros and cons to the blending of, you know, black culture within predominantly white uh, activities like snowboarding and? Well, that's a, pr that's a, that's a complex question. Yeah. And in some ways it speaks to, so there's a guy named David Rodiger. He wrote a book called Toward the Abolition of Whiteness. Yeah. And uh, he spent a lot of time talking about racial politics of working class cultures. Yeah. And he said, in, in one of his papers, he talks about the difference between crossover and crossing over. Mm -hmm. So crossover is the extent to which uh, predominantly white suburban young men yeah. um, tend to gravitate towards hip hop, mm -hmm. so-called gangsta culture, mm -hmm. 
and, and you know the backwards baseball cap you, you mentioned the mm -hmm. baggy pants mm -hmm. so there's this sort of this sartorial politics of blackness that's always based on a bit of a stereotype yeah. right um that would be crossover the extent mm -hmm. to which white kids are into what they perceive to be authentic black culture yeah that's crossover yeah right but the, the, the real change, the real uh, critical pedagogy comes when crossover becomes crossing over. This isn't to suggest that someone puts on blackface by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, yeah. But all of a sudden when you realize that the, the, the cultural practices and the products that you're consuming come from a certain place, they come from yeah. a time, yeah. they come from a certain context that is it, it's chock-a-block with politics yeah. and, and you know, discussions of discrimination and racism and police mm. brutality. Mm. So once you actually take an interest in that, yeah. And, and you start actually um, not embracing necessarily, yeah. but asking serious questions about mm -hmm. how these cultural products can articulate these serious politics. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have a certain transition moving from crossover to cross, sorry, from crossover to crossing over. Yeah. So it's not inherently problematic, but historically speaking, it's something that Greg Tate, he wrote a book called Everything But the Burden. He writes also for the Village Voice. And he said that he wrote this book called Everything But the Burden. And in this book, he said that. Historically speaking, it didn't just start with, you know, Eminem or, or yeah. you know, some, some white kids yeah. all of a sudden interested in NWA. Yeah. It, st it actually goes back before that. You could talk about colonial politics yeah. in terms of, you know, 1800s, 1900s, but in, in, in American culture, it really comes back to Norman Mailer's book, White Negro, and, and the beat culture, this fetishization of jazz and blackness as cool. Yeah. And uh, Tate says that historically speaking, white kids have wanted everything from black culture except the burden of being black, right? So the idea here is that, hey, I can actually get a great deal of social capital by dressing in a hip hop fashion, but the yeah. difference of course is that I can, I can turn my ball cap around when I see the cops. Yeah. Whereas if you're black, you, you don't get to turn your skin around and become white. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. So there's, there's a long historical conversation about not just cultural appropriation, but the fetishization that come up, that, a decontextualization of the authentic blackness from its yeah. historical and cultural moorings. Yeah. If that makes any sense. So it's not inherently problematic if you're able to draw some connections to the, the, the struggle yeah. and, and uh, the different, they're kind of like white supremacist capitalist overtones mm -hmm. of, of the commodification of hip hop culture, the extent yeah. to which blackness has been at the heart of modernity in yeah. North America, yeah, yeah, not yeah. just in terms of the construction of an economic system in and through slavery, but through cultural yeah. production as well. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think Chuck D wrote a book and uh, he wrote, well, he's probably written several books, but Chuck D talks about the extent to which black folks have been prioritized in American culture as nothing but athletes and entertainers. That's it. Mm -hmm. You can't be seen as scientists yeah, yeah, yeah. and so forth. So it, it is interesting to think of how, yeah. Black labor is actually, and this is a nice foray into sport, black labor is at the heart of what is conceived of as the authentic American experience in its culture. Mm -hmm. and, and some people talk about um, the extent to which black muscle, William Roden wrote a book, you probably know it. Uh, William Roden, William Roden wrote a book, <laughs> The 40, 40 Million Dollar Slave. Yeah. He says that at the heart of the American sporting empire mm -hmm. is black muscle. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's focusing predominantly on basketball and football, football yeah. uh, but, but he borrows from this idea of the plantation metaphor, mm -hmm. the extent to which everybody doing the work, mm -hmm. it's predominantly black muscle, but the people owning those bodies, and we get a really glaring example of this in the NFL, predominantly white guys, right? Yeah. So the extent to which this mimics a plantation arrangement is, is still quite trenchant in contemporary culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to go back at the, to my own experience and sort of trying to draw upon what you're saying. So I think when I would listen back as a young teenage Scot, listen yep. to rap music, yep. I connected to certain things. So I grew up in a small town. Right. Um, obviously, I, I'm not in a ghetto. I'm not in yeah. some of the same scenarios. But there were certain messages that gravitated to me. So one was that the only way to get out was through either sport yeah. or entertainment yeah there wasn't much upward mobility i mean for us the choice was be a farmer or that you know that was it right yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah and if yeah. you weren't interested in that like education wasn't uh okay. well known in my town yeah, right yeah, so even yeah. how many people live in your town 300 people okay arundel quebec right like i think the town the town newspaper put out a story 
when I got accepted to do a PhD. Really? Right. So it's not it's not something that many people yeah, grow up yeah. in Arundel, Quebec, and then That's go amazing. and pursue academia. So there was that. You know, you have to make it out either through some kind of entertainment yeah. perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other two was, and again, I, I I'm the whitest looking guy out there, but I grew up as an English speaking guy yeah. in a super super French yeah. neighborhood. Yeah. So we actually faced a ton of discrimination. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. So a yeah, ton absolutely. of it. Like, you know, yeah. you'd be in a locker room and the coaches would be uh talking about how like if someone did something stupid or bad or whatever, they say he plays like an Englishman, right? Interesting. And like Interesting. right in your face when yeah, you're yeah, sitting yeah. there, right? Yeah. And then like you know, there there'd be uh, you know, English slurs like in French they called it tight cafe and okay. whatever, like square yeah. head for yeah. some reason, I guess English have uh, yeah. square heads <laughs> like, yeah, i don't know where that yeah, comes from yeah. but like actually face a large degree of discrimination oh, yeah. growing up so there's sure. certain components that you can draw to in that music that actually apply to yeah to yeah our, to that's not an, that's not an arbitrary comparison yeah. you're making because yeah. historically speaking as you would know growing up in quebec yeah. the, the the quebec claw often yeah. in a lot of literary circles particularly around the 1970s drew mm. upon this idea of the white negro yeah they didn't use negro of course yeah uh they, they drew upon that analogy of being, we are the Negroes of Canada, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The extent to which uh, an Anglo-centric culture yeah. was, was seen historically as oppressing Quebecers, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So this idea of, a, of, of both, both a real and imagined form of oppression, yeah. it, it's, it, it's there. Mm -hmm. But the extent to which blackness serves as this ready-made metaphor for it as well. If it's, it's for a similar reason, you find a lot of popularity of Hip hop and rap in indigenous communities as well, yeah. right? Yeah, like yeah. Kobima's War Party. Yeah. I mean, they're using rap as a vernacular to voice criticisms of a white supremacist society, but they're doing it in ways that borrows from this this perception of blackness, but mm -hmm. also contributes to a, a different articulation of resistance. So there's there's kind of a Benedict Andrew with Anderson would say there's a, an imagined community mm -hmm. be, between your experiences, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for instance, and, yeah. and the hip hop community. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah so that's pretty. Pretty interesting. Yeah. So I think uh, one of the things I, I noticed actually that you've recently written uh, an article on concussion. Okay. Right? And yep. that ties a little bit into that power dynamics of the owners and the athletes. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that paper? Sure. Uh, so with our colleague, Dr. Halstein, mm -hmm. and uh, do you know Mike Ramsey and Nick Ricards? You may have met Nick. I don't think so. So Nick was a grad student of uh, Michelle and I, and uh, Mike was an undergrad student, and we wrote a paper. We've done a few pieces on the concussion stuff. It, it's it, the interesting thing about concussion. It's a hot topic right yeah. now, right? and it yeah. has been for a few years. Yeah. But and you would know this from writing papers. Mm -hmm. You finish one paper, and then you realize once you've built a lit review and done the analysis, you realize that they kind of snowball yeah. into different papers. Yeah. So uh, when you see the concussion paper, I'm thinking. Which one is that? Not not to yeah. say that I'm Johnny producer <laughs> and I have so many. Let me look at my CV. Which one are you talking about? No, that's not it at all. Yeah. But uh, I mean, the concussion piece that we worked on snowballed into these other pieces that broadly relate. I mean, there's that common thread of labor politics yeah. that, that uh, runs throughout. Uh, so the concussion piece we did involve uh, a discourse analysis, a textual analysis rather, of the ways in which mainstream media represented not just concussions, mm -hmm. but also the suicides, the recent suicides yeah. of former players mm -hmm. that were posthumously diagnosed with CTE. Yeah. Uh, and, and how these, timing they say is everything, right? Yeah. So the interesting thing about the concussion paper, the first one, is that when the concussion, they call it a crisis, but crisis would suggest it's an aberration. And yeah. You and I both know that concussions are actually intrinsic to hockey and yeah, and, and they're, built into, they're built into the game. Yeah. So there is no crisis. Yeah. An epidemic, sure. Yeah. A crisis, no. This yeah. is how it is. I can't imagine changing. Yeah. Uh, anyways, so as the so-called crisis emerges, and it, 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 it happens at the same time as many of these suicides of you know, their, Junior Seau, mm -hmm. um, some of the, the NHL players. Yeah. So you've got the suicides that are overlapping with the rise of the concussion crisis, and at the same time, it's overlapping with some lockouts in the NHL and, and the NFL, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got labor politics, you've got suicides, and you've got concussions. Yeah. And we thought, okay, this is interesting. There's a connection here. We perceive there to be, yeah. we perceive there to be a, a connection between these three 
phenomenon. We're, we're curious as to how the concussion is reported and how uh, the lockouts are reported in relationship to concussions in mainstream media. Yeah. And so we looked at a variety of mainstream publications and some, some niche sports publications and found that Obama said, I think in 2000, maybe it was 2008, he said that, okay, someone asked him about the NFL lockout and he said, well, you're basically talking about a discussion between millionaires and billionaires. And he thought, okay, that's an interesting way of putting things. Yeah, yeah. And it seemed to inform either implicitly or explicitly mm -hmm. many of the ways in which the popular reporters were talking about the lockout and concussions. Yeah. First of all, there's the idea that you knew what you were getting into. And also, there's the idea that you're a celebrity athlete. Yeah. If you play in these leagues, you're automatically a millionaire, which is misleading. We know this is not the case, right? Yeah. Particularly in the NFL, where you have that pyramid effect, where you've got the Bradys, the Breeze, the yeah. predominantly, not exclusively, pr predominantly the white quarterbacks at the top, mm -hmm. and then black muscle filling out the bottom of the pyramid, right? Yeah. And they don't make the kind of money that, that Brady and Breeze make. So the idea yeah. of the athlete, you're a professional athlete, you must be loaded, whereas you're escalating. Yeah. Right? That's, yeah. that's the kind of the, the knee-jerk assumption when and this isn't that, necessarily yeah. the case. And I think their career span is like average of a year. 3.4 years. Right? Yeah, there we go, yep. right? Yeah. So even if yep. you made 5 million, it's taxed at half, and then yep. you're down to 2.5, you've made it for three years. Right, right. And, yeah. and then you're brought into that culture where spending money is, is – Absolutely. part of the game and, and you're then, also looking right. after a lot of your family members yeah. and friends too right yeah. the, the idea of the, the athlete with the entourage I, I think it's both fact and fiction but um the interesting thing is the burden of probably black athletes to take care of each other yeah. because of a, a level of, of, of yeah. systemic racism particularly in the u.s but also in canada as we're, as we're learning right mm. um so we found that a lot of these popular press reports were automatically describing the athletes as spoiled yeah uh, they should play for the love of the game. And then the overlap with the concussion is when the athletes were seen to, when, when they were reported as, as committing suicide or accidentally mm -hmm. overdosing, it was seen as the individual's responsibility. They must have had a psychological problem, right? Yeah. So you, you see this with a lot of, uh, some of the critical theories that, that emerge in relation to psychology, yeah. to the development of the psych disciplines with industrial capitalism, this idea of individualizing and personalizing otherwise social problems right yeah yeah so the idea uh, of uh, you know you being an addict and, and leading to an overdose and accidental overdose and a death that must have been the problem of the athlete that wasn't the institution that demanded that this player go out injured or not beat the shit out of someone have the big hit yeah. and so forth yeah. and and then uh once your playing career is over in some cases it's been reported the players association the unions the league it's they're no longer seen as valuable. Yeah, right? yeah. They're no longer an asset, so it doesn't really matter because they're not playing. They're not adding value to the game anymore. Yeah. So there seemed to be this overlap. There, there was an underreporting. Well, there wasn't an underreporting of the concussion. Mm -hmm. There was a depoliticization of the ways in which the concussion was discussed mm -hmm. in the popular press. So we were trying to to sort of explore what we perceive to be these missing links. Yeah. So we see it as a labor problem at the professional level. The extent to which you have this what's it called the league of denial. It's a, it's a business issue in many yeah. cases, right? Yeah. So we, we saw that there was a political and an economic angle to the concussion discussion yeah. that wasn't actually being made in the popular press. Mm -hmm. And it is now, yeah. right? Uh, well, I shouldn't say it's, I mean, it's, it's made in, in um, overt ways through these different documentaries, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not always brought back to the idea of a labor policy. Mm -hmm. which ultimately, this is how we see it, right? Yeah. So one of the papers we talk about the extent to which you can draw from different literatures, obviously, to yeah. help explain the same phenomenon, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the first paper, we looked at how popular press does the reporting of concussions, lockouts, mm -hmm. uh, so on and so forth. And in uh, a subsequent paper, we looked at we tried to incorporate a different literature. So we looked at um, organ and tissue donation literature, cultural studies of organ donation. We okay. also looked at, uh, there's a guy named Vicente Navarro. He's a, a Marxist medical historian. And he, he was really interesting. His work is fascinating. So he said that, okay, if you want to study the black lung, for instance, yeah. you don't just say, okay, yeah, th there's this internal condition and it's obviously a problem mm -hmm. of this person. They, they have the black lung. How do we treat individuals? He said, no, you have to study, a true epidemiologist would actually study the social surroundings. Yeah. So Navarro said that, and he's not the first to say it, but he says it rather forcefully, 
The black lung is produced through relations of production in mining, in coal mining in particular, right? Yeah. So you actually can't separate the illness of the black lung from the wider social and political context of labor conditions of mm -hmm. coal mining. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to say, we, I mean, we're not being quite as forceful, but we're, we're trying to raise some questions that might ask, what happens if we discuss CTE as a condition that is inseparable from sport, yeah. particular sports, yeah. like combat sports, contact sports, so yeah. on and so forth. Um, but the idea is that the, the condition, the ailment, the, the, the illness is caught up with the sport. Yeah. And more importantly, with brain donations, these bodies, or rather these segments, these, these fragments of the body, the brains of these athletes are being sought precisely for what these people did for a living, right? Yeah. So there's, 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 um, there's an economic imperative at the heart of it, but there's also, you know, uh, there's a politics behind yeah. it. Yeah. Have you looked much into MMA? Um, it came up a few times, and yeah. boxing is quite prominent as well, yeah. the idea of being punch drunk. Yeah, yeah. but in MMA, there's the, it's, I feel like it's even worse than other sports where only a couple people make money. Right. If you have Conor McGregor, right. you have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, it's notoriously anti union. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and that's it. And they'll just toss people if they start talking about it. And right. Just end right. their career. Yeah. Yeah. But they will. Um, the, but that, how little they're paid. Yeah. And you see it too in the interviews where after the fight, and then they have these little bonuses, like if you knock someone out, okay. knock out of the night, okay. you get a you know fifty grand bonus right yeah. of the night, which yeah. incentivizes more reckless fighting. Right. Right. So right. that you're not just right. scoring right. points, you're trying to finish a fight, which okay. puts both you and the other fighter okay. at greater danger. Video right? game of some sort. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. 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 So then, uh, and they'll say it too. You know, I wish I was more exciting uh, afterwards if they just kind of played it safe. Right. And then uh, these people will win the bonus. Their stories too. It's like, oh, what are you going to do with this bonus? And like, yeah. I'm going to move my family now to finally we're going to be together again right. or, and right. they're just paid yeah. so little yeah. and the training yeah. is so intensive yeah. because if you're not training all day you're you're getting in the ring with a killer like right. right someone who is specialized in hurting people right so if you're if you're coming there untrained trying to make money part-time somewhere yeah. else yeah. you're in big trouble when you get in the ring so absolutely yeah so well, then, you, i mean the, the whole idea of the celebrity athlete and yeah. you bring up conor mcgregor yeah, I often call him Conor McDavid. What are, what's with the Conor mix? Seriously, it's confusing. They're not the same guy. Yeah, yeah. But the idea, I mean, when you see, I mean, he, he shows up in his three-piece suits, yeah. you see him driving around in his Bentley or yeah, whatever yeah. kind of boutique automobile he's driving, yeah. and you think, oh yeah, an MMA fighter, automatically rich, kind of like the Johnny yeah. Manziel, right? Yeah. I mean, GQ frequently reported on Johnny Manziel's frivolous spending habits, you yeah. know? And so, the, the, I wouldn't say the masses, but you know, the average Joe and Jane would, would get this impression that athletes are swimming in money, this yeah. life of privilege. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. That's only the, that's the, the top, the yeah. few. Yeah. There was a book by a, an old goalie back in the day. His name was Rick Hines, I think. He wrote a book called Many Are Called, Few Are Signed. Yeah. And it was, it was, I mean, it wasn't really political, but he was trying to debunk this idea that the celebrity athlete is, is a, it's not a myth. Yeah. But it's, a, a, it's an over-extrapolation, right? Yeah. The whole idea that every UFC fighter is Conor McGregor. Yeah. So, and we know this from reality TV shows as well, yeah. Ultimate Fighter, right? Yeah. We know that many of these people come from pretty, pretty uh, marginalized backgrounds. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And they're, they're fighting for their lives in some cases. Yeah. And we like that story when someone Absolutely. comes from nothing Absolutely. and then succeeds and becomes Absolutely. the next champion and Rocky came Balboa. from the streets. And, yeah. yeah. So they're like... Yeah. We crave that from an entertainment perspective. Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't want the, the upper middle class kid who had the best coach in the world because right. their parent could right. afford it and beats the of crap out of everyone in it, life. It feeds it's, into yeah. the, the, it's the Horatio yeah. Alder myth, right? Yeah. The yeah. myth of meritocracy. Yeah. So yeah. the problem with that, of course, is that it, it actually pathologizes those that can't lift themselves up, right? Yeah. So well, Conor McGregor did. He was a plumber and then he was unemployed and, and now look at him. Yeah. So what's your problem? What's your excuse, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a really, it's quite, it's one of the most fucked up myths of, <laughs> of the American dream. Right? Yeah. And we are talking about the American dream. Yeah, yeah. 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 I find, yeah. I've recently been struggling with um, 
the idea of meritocracy because okay. to be honest, I, I always thought about it and okay. I always thought it was, yeah, I, that was me. I, until recently I said, yeah. Hey, why can't you just do yeah. it? Right. Yeah. Because yeah. again, I said, I, I came in the realm of academia. I would say I would be on the, um, on the outs, right. Or, or, or be that, that outlier, right who shouldn't have gone that far. So I said, right. if I grew up, we had no money. Academia was not something that was pushed by anyone in the town or pursued or spoken about. I took out student loans. I pulled myself up. I didn't borrow. I had no money given to me from family and then I made it, right? So right. if I can do it, anyone can do it, Yeah. right? Yeah. And then recently I've been sort of <laughs> exposed to this idea where I said, Okay, well, just because maybe Conor McGregor does it or yeah. some other kid goes and becomes an academic who prop from a town where people don't do that, yeah. it doesn't mean that everyone can. Right. Right? Right. So, And, and it's, especially in the realm of sport. Yeah. The myth of, of meritocracy in and through sport, especially as it relates to black kids, mm. I mean, the extent to which it pathologizes anybody that can't make it in sports, but yep. If you look at the people we're talking about here, that we'll put the McGregor's and the McDavid's yep. together, these are superhumans, yep. right? Yeah. And in some cases, it doesn't really matter what their background is because, and LeBron James as well. These are super athletes. Yep. They have extraordinary talents, extraordinary yep. work ethics. Yeah. This is this is a part of their makeup, right? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the whole idea of LeBron made it. Why can't you? Yeah. LeBron. It's King James. <laughs> yeah. That's why I can't do it. I'm not King James. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, the, but that myth, I mean, it, yeah. does, it does important cultural work, doesn't it? Yeah. Because it actually, it, it's the blame culture. Yeah. So when you, when you look at, or, or when, you, when you look at these athletes that make it and they come from humble beginnings, yeah. right? that old story, like Rocky, yeah. uh, it, it, it really does pathologize mm -hmm. and it, it denigrates those that can't do it. They can't. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Do you think... I wonder though the pot like is there a positive on that because it does give the hope for the yeah. kid or yeah uh, and what the balance is on I mean <laughs> it gives everyone hope but at the end of the road right point zero zero one percent it's a false hope yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so is is it a good thing to have that hope for seventeen years to then get your dreams crushed yeah I think part of the problem is it's always already hyper individual right yeah it's always a focus on the self. Yeah. rather than the community mm. and it's 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 built on hyper competitiveness too which yeah. we know quite well being from the sport background right? yeah. yeah which over the years you and we've had this discussion before this idea competing for food at the trough yeah. and the yeah. trough is getting smaller and smaller we yeah. haven't used the trough for the idea of funding yeah. right yeah yeah or or you know uh promotions or whatever yeah right this yeah. idea of competing 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 at the expense of building community. It's not always the case, of course, yeah, but yeah. the way that these particular myths, the cultural work that they do, it, it really is hyper-individual and it's quite problematic. Mm -hmm. But it's easy to, it, it's easy to uh, buy into though, right? So yeah. the hope is, yeah, you, you, can, you can, you know, follow those dreams. It's mm -hmm. about you achieving mm -hmm. certain things, the, the glory, if you will, the riches. Yeah. But it's ultimately quite an individual experience. Which, which is kind of like, that's the North American idea, isn't it? Yeah. This idea of the individual. I mean, it obviously extends beyond that, but um, I, I, there's sport, there's reality television, this idea of competition at the heart of everything. Yeah. This is a total tangent, but when I see these children's baking shows where <laughs> little kids are competing against one another yeah. over who can make the best souffle, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> why, didn't they, why didn't they get together? Why don't they teach each other how to cook, right? Instead, they're, so they learn to yeah. see each other. Instead of colleagues, classmates, friends, they see themselves as, as enemies, right? Yeah. This kid's going to make a better souffle than me? No way. Yeah. Right? I mean, it just, yeah. it break, it, in some cases, it breaks my heart, and then it just makes me feel dirty, so I try not to watch that show. <laughs> yeah. like, where are the reality shows where, where there's a cooperative uh, imperative? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, maybe we're going to solve this problem. I mean, it does happen occasionally in things like Survivor, but ultimately there's that kind yeah. of infighting that, yeah, yeah. that uh, yeah. So I try not to watch those baking shows. <laughs> yeah, stay away from those. <laughs> stay away from those. Yeah. Awesome. Do you guys watch much reality television? No. 
as you know, we're the crime family. <laughs> you are the crime family. Yeah. We're Sons of Anarchy. Yeah, we actually, it turns out we're the last people in the world to watch that show. I've seen a few episodes. I haven't watched a lot, though. Huh? I do like Kim Coates. Yeah. Kim Coates is in it, and he is, uh, he's a classic Canadian actor. He's really good. Which, who is he? I don't know who he is in it. I haven't seen him. <laughs> okay, okay. He's kind of creepy looking. Yeah. Yeah, which doesn't really help. Yeah, and a lot of them are. Yeah. Is it Ron Perlman in it as well? Oh, I'm not kidding. Okay, Ron Perlman was in The Capture. Remember The Capture? No. We, okay, remember the, the soldier from Iraq? The Iraq war or Afghanistan uh, vet in the UK? He was caught on I've video. He's caught on video killing his lawyer. Remember that? <laughs> I don't think I've seen Are you it. sure? I thought we talked about The Capture. Yeah. And it's about surveillance told and, me to and talk uh, it. what's it yeah. called? Uh, correcting. Remember when they correct the video footage? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ron Perlman good. is yeah, a yeah, CIA yeah, agent. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's a great show. Watch it is a good show. Yeah. Yeah, really yeah. good show. Yeah. But then Ron Perlman is the head CIA guy. Yeah. He's also Hellboy. Okay. And long ago, he was in a series called Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Yeah, where he played the Beast to yeah. uh, Linda Hamilton's Beauty, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. So those of you listening, Sean probably has the most in-depth knowledge of it's just movies random, and shows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he, we always chat, and then I'm this dummy who has no idea the names of the actors. I've got a few years on you. Yeah. I've got a few years on you. Yeah. You talk about these hopes and dreams going up. My yeah. hope and dream, I mean, I had the box. I had a television, so I was yeah. raised through a television. Yeah. No offense to my mother. <laughs> yeah. I spent a lot of time in front of a television. I still do. I think so we only had, like, two channels. So there you go. The Magic oh, School Bus was a big one, actually. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So how many seasons are there? I don't want to say, I don't know what direction the conversation you want to go, but it feels organic to ask. Yeah. How many seasons are there of Sons of Anarchy? I feel like there's like nine. Like nine? Oh my goodness. It? So what, what are you watching on? What platform? Uh, Netflix. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So watching on Netflix. It just came out too, and there was originally two, and then I think they just added all the other ones like a week or oh, two ago. Really? So we're pretty fond nice. of out of shows. Okay. Uh, there's also, there's a, there's a, uh, I feel like it's a Chicano one that stars James... Earl James, Earl James, Edward James almost. And it's about like a, a Chicano motorcycle gang. Oh. I can't remember what it's called. It might be on like the Spike Network or something. Or is it like a spinoff or is it? I don't know if it is officially associated with Sons yeah. of Anarchy, but yeah. it, seems to, it seems to be in the same cultural conversation. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, the reason I didn't think I'd like the show, but. Not so a, you want a motorcycle now? <laughs> no. <laughs> or just the jet, just the vest, yeah. just the leather vest, yeah. Yeah. prong horns. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we need to do. Yeah. Uh, we could probably get Freddie on it. Freddie can get us a discount somewhere. Like for classes. sure. Yeah. yeah. He's Freddie a did. rep for like. Everything. Yeah. 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 He's probably a Harley rep. Probably. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. Somehow. 40% yeah. off. <laughs> yeah. So as a movie buff, uh, yeah. I'm going to go, what's, uh, what's your favorite movie? Oh. It's a hard one. Yeah. Yeah, it is hard. Um. It depends what I, it depends on my mood. Yeah. It depends on, okay, so I have a few. Yeah. Um, best, let's, why don't, why don't I change the question a bit and say most memorable films I've seen in the past five years. Okay. Perfect. Moonlight would be one of them. Okay. For sure. Barry Jenkins, Moonlight. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. It was one of the, I mean, it, it won the Oscar for best picture. Yeah. Right? Uh, Barry Jenkins film stars uh, Mahershala, uh, Mahershala Ali. I uh, loved Moonlight, loved the way it was filmed. Love the content. Uh, haven't seen Parasite yet, but want to see oh, it. Oh, Parasite was good. Yeah. Okay, don't tell me how no, it ends or anything like that. Now, if we're talking about uh, Pong Joon Ho, I really love. Did you ever see uh, Okja? No. Okay, Okja is kind of this like sci-fi. Seems like like Peta might have written mm -hmm. parts of it, mm -hmm. but we became vegetarians <laughs> shortly after watching Okja. That's yep. a really fascinating show. I also love Elf. Uh, Children of Men. Did you ever see Children of Men? No, no. That's one of my favorite films yeah. in terms of, uh, well, just in terms of politics, in terms of quality filming. Um, Ken Loach did a film a few years ago called, was it I, Daniel Blake? Yeah, hard, if you know anything about Ken Loach films, they're difficult to watch because they're so, they're powerful films. Yeah. You feel these films. Yeah. You feel them and think, holy shit. So you want to talk about like the myth of meritocracy? Yeah. The myth of meritocracy is debunked in a lot of Ken Loach films. Okay. He often uh, has a certain political bent that would be opposed to things like Thatcherism yeah. in, in the UK, right? Uh, a big critic of neoliberalism. Um, he kind of celebrates documents. Yeah. 
Archives, Working Class Life in the UK. So I Daniel Blake is really good. I thought that was pretty solid. We've been watching a lot of stuff lately. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite film these days, but we, we, go, we bounce around series. Yeah. And um, we've been watching some heavy ones, but also some lighter ones. Yeah. So I have to say, and I'm a bit embarrassed to say so. I was going to ask you a guilty pleasure now. Okay, so Kim's I... Convenience. Yeah. Have you ever seen it? No. You know the series I'm talking about? No. No? Okay, so it's CBC. Yeah. Uh, it's a uh, uh, Korean immigrant runs a oh, okay, yeah, yeah, actually, in, yeah, in yeah, Toronto, yeah. right? Now, when I, when I first saw the trailers for Kim's Convenience, I was like, ah, oh, fuck, here we go. We're going to have another little mosque on the prairie. Yeah. This series that is all about kind of glamorizing in a banal way, if yeah. that makes any sense. Uh, glamorizing Canadian multiculturalism uh, and totally downplays. It kind of rewrites the prairies as a pretty benevolent, a bit naive yeah. and a bit bumpkin, but yeah. not really racist, right? Oh, yeah. fuck, here we go. We're going to be whitewashing racism in Canada. And I have to say, Kim's Convenience, it's not only is it exceptionally well written, yeah. it doesn't really do that. I, yeah. I actually don't think white people are the target audience. Yeah. I, I think immigrants and, and children of immigrants are the target okay, audience. Yeah. And at first I kind of thought, okay, any res- for me, any responsible film or television series that has a non-white cast needs to deal with racism. Mm-hmm. I used to think that, and yeah. to a certain extent, I still do. But once I realized that racism makes sporadic appearances yeah. in Kim's Convenience, I, I l- eventually learned by watching Kim's Convenience that this is not a series that glamorizes multiculturalism necessarily, and it's not a series that's designed to teach white people about the other. Yeah. It's a series that doesn't necessarily feel obligated to confront white supremacy because it's set in a community in which white supremacy is not the dominating life force. Yeah. So I thought, okay, this is really refreshing. And there is a quite a, there's a variety of different roles and I think mm-hmm. it's actually, it's, it is a guilty pleasure. Yeah. We, we call it a palate cleanser. Yeah. So we'll spend the evening, my yeah. partner and I, yeah. we'll spend the evening watching some heavier stuff and then yeah. we'll need to finish off the night before bed yeah. with something lighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. convenience yeah. was, was the lighter one, but it was yeah. still, it was no less than light. Yeah. So some of the heavier things that we've been watching, we just finished the BBC. Did I tell you about that? Years and years? Yeah. Oh, yeah. a little, it's touching too many nerves yeah. with the pandemic and with Trump and yeah, yeah. but it's good. Yeah. It's good. It ends on this interesting kind of high note. But yeah, years and years. We watch years and years. So a favorite film, my goodness. I, I sort of touched on a bunch. What's yeah. your favorite? Do you have a favorite film? Favorite film? There's a couple. I, I, I still love Fight Club. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. one was always, I always loved that movie. Yeah. Uh, Gladiator was a good one. Yeah. I like Troy. I guess, I guess I'm seeing that one. Brad Pitt fan, old okay. back in the day. Oh yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I like the I like those ones. Uh, my guilty pleasure, the one I'm embarrassed to tell people that I love, yeah. white chicks. White chicks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I recall liking white chicks yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's so dumb, but I uh, yeah. I don't know, makes me laugh for some reason. So uh, Gladiator did, did uh, was Joaquin Phoenix in Gladiator? I think yeah, he was. yeah, he was. Was he the emperor or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in it. Yeah. Russell Crowe. Did you see Joker? Yes. Okay, and um, thoughts on Joker? I didn't see it. It's uh, it's weird because it's really well done and it's well acted. I don't know if I would recommend it. Okay. It, I mean, I left feeling like crap after the. Okay. But I don't. Like, I think that's the point. Okay. So it achieves yeah. its yeah. goal. Yeah. Uh, it's just dark. It's okay. really, really dark. I gathered from from the snippets that I saw that. It was yeah. Dark. Yeah, so I left the theater and I just, I went with a, a friend of Kelsey's dad's, actually went on a little mandate to the okay. movies, yeah. yeah, and then, uh, to watch the Joker, then. yeah, and then we left and we're like, we're having a couple beers laughing around and then we watch this movie and just, jeez, <laughs> that was heavy, yeah, uh, so it's not, a, it's not a feel good and there's not like comedy sprinkled in, it's okay. not your okay. usual superhero movie right it does a little of everything yes yeah it is, seems to yeah. be an origin story that deviates from the formula of, yeah. of the marvel universe well, yeah. Not marvel, yeah but so it's, you know uh, what I mean. yeah i don't know that yeah i don't know if i would recommend but it's, it's okay well acted and okay. well cast and well joaquin phoenix is amazing yeah I, I really admire his work yeah did you ever see i think it's called i was never really here he plays oh, this uh war vet who becomes kind of a uh, 
a hitman. Mm -hmm. But he's just, he's really good at nonverbal communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he can make his body speak louder than his words. Yeah, yeah. And uh, did you ever see The Master? No. Philip Seymour Hoffman? No. It's a Paul Thomas Anderson film. And that was one of the first moments where I was watching it thinking, Joaquin Phoenix is amazing. Yeah. He plays the uh, sociopath incredibly well. Yeah. And then and then he, he morphs into a character yeah. like the one on in Her. Did you ever yeah. see Her? I don't think I've seen yeah, that. Her is a good film as well, Spike Jones from Her mm-hmm. Technology. Scarlett, <laughs> Scarlett Johansson is the voice of this. This is a typical, a typical conversation between yeah. us. You saying, have you seen it? And me going, no. <laughs> and then I continue the conversation <laughs> yeah. with myself. Yeah. 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 Check out Her. Her is pretty good. Her is so. pretty good. Tom, Tom Hardy's another one, I think. Oh, yes, he Tom doesn't Hardy. need to say a word, and you know exactly yeah. how he's feeling. And yeah. He's, yeah, absolutely. He's absolutely. Act, so he's yeah. in Capone now, right? He is Capone. Yeah, he's yeah. A titular character. I haven't is that seen that one. I don't no. think it's out yet. Yeah. Yeah. Your favorite Tom Hardy film? Favorite one. I like Bronson's really good. Okay. Oh, The Fighter. But I, yes. I yes. love The Fighter. But... <laughs> Historically speaking, I love movies about brothers. <laughs> so, yeah. Me and my brother are both really close. And Kels, okay. Kels will joke about that, right? Oh, so really? we, what did we watch? We watched one movie, Hell, Come Hell, Hell, High Water. Hell, High Water, yeah. And uh, I love With, that uh, movie. Chris Pine yeah. and uh, yeah. Ben, ben Shit, what's his name? Ben Foster. Yeah. All right, so Kels, we finished the movie. Kels is like, yeah, I don't know. And I'm like, what? That was amazing, right? And she goes, you just like it because it's about brothers, right? It's actually an interesting political commentary as well. So we were shortly after, or during the Great Recession, right? Yeah. And it's about pillaging from banks, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty decent film as well. Yeah, it was funny too. Then she goes, I'm picking the next one. And she, uh, she picked one. I'll give a spoiler alert here. I have to. We, I can't remember the name of it, but Ben Affleck's in it. He's like a CIA guy. Um, okay. He, anyways, he's, we get like five, five minutes into the movie. Yeah. And he's hunting. There's this like bat. Oh, guy, I know right? the one you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't count remember the title. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Is yeah, that yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. Um, like it. Yeah. And there's this other guy, right, who's his nemesis and okay. just as skilled and whatever. And within five minutes, I go, that guy's his brother. And then Kels goes, shut up, right? And I'm like, I know a brother when I see one. <laughs> that's the big turning point, right? So yeah. she picks a movie that's because I just like movies about brothers. Yeah. The big spin is it's his brother. That's funny. <laughs> so it's really funny. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't see Locke, though, did you? No. Okay. No. Yeah. I know that Locke was on one of the television stations. You can't watch Locke mm. with commercials. It has to be one fell swoop. Yeah, yeah. And I told you, you know the premise, right? He's driving. It's just him driving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You told me. And he has conversations yeah. on his phone. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a moment where I thought, Tom Hardy is not just Bronson. Or he's yeah. not just, I mean, don't get me yeah. wrong. That's a fantastic yeah. film. He is, uh, he's a cerebral actor, too. Yeah. No, he's good. Yeah. Everything. He's made quite the transformation, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wait, what was, was he in Rock and Was it Rock and Roller? He was just I a slight was, guy, yeah. right? Yeah. He can really walk up or slip yeah. down depending oh, yeah. on the role. Yeah. But he's been in a lot of good movies. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I guess we'll move. We'll transition now back into. Uh, let's get back into some sport acting. Oh, okay. So I've always been curious. You teach uh, the course social constructions of the body. Yeah. What are some of the main themes in that course? It has nothing to do with sports. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. I, that's actually how I start the lecture. Yeah. All right, jock snippers. If you're looking for sports, you better go elsewhere. I'm just yeah. kidding. I don't actually say that. I may have said that once actually. Yeah. Um, so it is the main things of social construction of the body. It does incorporate sport insofar yeah. as we talk about discipline and surveillance okay. of the body. Uh, it's more of a cultural studies. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The extent to which, I mean, if you think about professional athletes, yeah. just the breakdown of skill set. Right? Yeah. So bodies are often manipulated in a variety of ways yeah. from a very young age. If you think about learning how to kick a soccer ball, so yeah. a, a, a pitch or whatever, right? Yeah. So there's often, I mean, it seems really naive. This is how we learn at sport, right? Yeah. But it's important to go back to those early building blocks and realize that there's nothing natural about what we're doing, even though through repetition in various institutions and through sport itself. Yeah, yeah. It becomes become reflexive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It becomes reflexive, right? Yeah. So we come to think that boys throw a certain way and girls throw a certain way, right? Yeah. But we need to realize if we go back to those early building blocks that these are all learned behaviors. Yeah. Right? And it's entirely arbitrary who gets taught what. 
Yeah. So uh, the discipline and surveillance, it, it ties into, there are some sporting aspects insofar as you look at how we are, sometimes we're forced into doing certain things with our body. Sometimes we're encouraged to participate in our own discipline and surveillance. When, when you and I are doing a, a pregame meal, for instance, we yeah. will avoid certain foods. Okay, Not because yeah. there's a dietitian staring at us saying, don't eat that ice cream. Yeah. It's, we've, we've learned to internalize this. We call it a carceral gaze. Right? Yeah. There are repercussions to the decisions we make. Yeah. Therefore, we better make the right decisions. Yeah. So uh, this idea of discipline and surveillance and, and the idea of, of monitoring your diet, your exercise. Yeah. If you don't do those crunches, you're not going to be able to do this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the interesting thing is, and this ties into the individual responsibility that we were talking about earlier, yeah. we, we discipline ourselves and we discipline each other now, right? Yeah. We monitor ourselves. So, I mean, in terms of academia, uh, there are professors that will spend uh, extra hours in their office with the door open giving the presentation. Some of them are very productive and active. Yeah. Yeah. Many of them are not, yeah. right? Yeah. But they're giving, they're, they're performing intellectualism insofar as they're at their office they're giving the impression as though if someone were to walk by they're hard at work right? yeah, yeah so it's it's really about controlling our behavior mm. uh, Irving Goffman the, the late sociologist would describe it as a body idiom so yeah. we use this vernacular that we inherit to communicate certain things about our actions mm. sometimes it's in sports sometimes it's in diet right yeah sometimes it's in the clothes and the hairstyles we wear mm. so the body class it it has some relationship to sport but it's more about reading the body as a sign in a variety of social and historical contexts. Okay. So we talk, and it's, it's, it's kind of a sociology of the body course, yeah. but it's also a cultural studies of the body course. There is a difference. So a yeah. sociology of the body course would look at the work of Michel Foucault, Irving Goffman, maybe some Mary Douglas if you're into anthropology, and they'd look at things like uh, the panopticon, they would look at uh, the body idiom. A cultural studies approach would explore the bodily metaphors. Mm -hmm. So a cultural studies approach to the body would look at uh, semiotics and the different ways in which hairstyles, for instance, would correspond to different means in different times and places. So one of the themes that we talk about in that course, uh, we rely on the work of uh, a guy by the name of Kobina Mercer. He has an article called Black Hairstyle Politics. Okay. So we spend uh, a day talking about the ways in which afros and dreadlocks hairstyles were seen as resistant in the 1960s, and they, be, they became commercialized and commodified mm -hmm. shortly after. So the idea here is that there's no inherent meaning to the body. Yeah. Sure, we have these different biological processes, but the meanings of those bodies are socially constructed. Mm -hmm. So the do you meanings of those bodies. Neoliberalism so, about. Uh... Uh, we do when we talk about the body and commercialism yeah. and consumer culture. We do talk a little bit about neoliberalism. We have yeah. personal responsibility. Um, the idea of the commodification of everything, yeah, right. Uh, but we spend a great deal of time talking about a good portion of the course is unpacking the things that we've come to internalize reflexively, as you said, yeah. that we, we just kind of know. Yeah. It just is what it is, right? Yeah. What's a desirable body? A desirable body is thin, mm. predominantly lighter skin, straight hair. We are encouraged to think that this has always been the case, yeah. but this is only relatively recently. Yeah. through various institutions or what al are called ideological state apparatuses, we're encouraged to internalize this as normal and natural. So it's through repetition yeah. that things seem to become natural and normal, right? Okay, but the purpose yeah, yeah, of the yeah, course yeah. is to back up and say, wait a second, someone made a conscious decision about what image to put on that magazine. Yeah. It's not because white people are naturally beautiful, mm -hmm. it's because of a variety of white supremacist logic, for example. Right? So, so the idea of seeing FedEx truck. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So the idea of seeing the same looking person over yep. and over yep. and over again yep. during Absolutely. a certain period of time would be what would construct maybe what we think is athletic or what we think. Yeah, is absolutely. Yeah. Or even just taking the signify. Okay. If we get into semiotics and we get into structural linguistics, we use this, this idea of the signifier, right? Or the sign, which is yep. made up of two components. I don't want to get too didactic here. But the idea here is that there's the signifier that does the, that thing that does the representing, mm -hmm. and then the signified, the meaning. Yeah. Now we are taught to these various institutions that that relationship is permanent, it's fixed yeah. across time and space. Yeah. But in the social constructions of the body, we learn that it's entirely arbitrary. There's no necessary relationship yeah. between the signifier athlete and the meaning, Connor yeah. McDavid, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So we have different examples. An athlete, we use athlete as a signifier. We say, okay, so in, in a historical period, when I said, in a particular historical period, let's say in the 1800s, I said yeah. athlete, 
maybe you have uh, a picture of a guy with a roly-poly mustache on a penny fart. Yeah. <laughs> White guy, probably European, most likely a property yeah. owner. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That was the signifier, mm -hmm. or rather that was the meaning behind the signifier athlete. Yeah. But in a different historical period, in a more contemporary sense, uh, I'll show a picture of uh, Kathy Freeman, the Aboriginal yeah. runner yeah. in Australia. This is an athlete too. Yeah. In another historical context, I'll show a picture of Mark Zupan, yeah. who was a quad rugby player, right? Yeah. This is an athlete as well. But mm -hmm. if you look at different historical periods, in the time of, let's say, uh, the, 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 the mustache, penny farthing guy, yeah. when you said athlete, the Aboriginal woman was not considered an athlete, yeah. nor was Mark Zupan. Yeah. So this signifier of athlete, meaning one thing, it changes across time and space. Yeah. And this is the heart of political struggle, right? Yeah. So when you say citizen, or when you say woman, or any kind of signifier, really, you yeah. need to realize that that relationship between signifier and signified is historically contingent and constructed, and we can raise questions about who gets included and who yeah. gets excluded from that, that category of athlete, for instance, right? Yeah. So uh, not too long ago, um, disabled folks were not considered athletes, right? Yeah. The disabled subject was not considered productive, mobile, yeah. uh, autonomous, Mm -hmm. So on and so forth, but it's through raising questions about the meanings and the inclusivity and exclusivity of that category, mm -hmm. and you see how this all ties into the body too. Right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the meanings of bodies, in other words, change across time and space, and we need to raise questions about who decides, and and what are the the uh, consequences? What are the results of making those decisions about inclusion and exclusion? Okay. So so the focus really is on. I guess if you're trying to deconstruct it, the first lesson that you're trying to show is that what we think may be treat, uh, true is something that we just experience over and over and over again. This and is it. Okay. We need, that would be the first one. And the second would be that the questions that need to be asked are who is in control of what uh, that sure. repetition is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So we have a lot of discussion about discourse and ideology yeah. and power relations, right? Yeah. So the things that we receive in, in the, the uh, dominant curriculum, for instance, we can raise questions about it. Mm -hmm. And it's not normal. It's yeah. not natural. This category, there is a, I can't remember who said it. Natu the nature is the alibi of power. Yeah. So when someone says, oh, it's natural. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The girls throw that way. Yeah. What that appeal to nature is concealing is the extent to which sexism, sexism and discrimination yeah. underwrites a whole range of bodily practices. Mm -hmm. And I guess exposure to opportunity, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. So, I mean, the social construction yeah. of the body, it goes in a variety of yeah. directions. So I found... It gets weird. <laughs> I guess on this, on this topic, I found it interesting in academia. When I first came in, yeah. I was like a heavily muscled guy. Yeah. And everyone thought I was an idiot. Interesting. And once I lost oh. weight and became more athletic yeah. and less... Uh, like everybody at the... At yeah, in academia. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's just okay. like I was yeah. the joke of each class, like yeah. the meathead, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And then once I lost weight and became athletic looking instead yeah. of, you know, bulky and right. built, right. then suddenly I was smarter. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I, I, I... Very fit, Cartesian, right? Yeah, I fit yeah. The, yeah. the trend now. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, we do talk a little bit about Cartesian dualism. Yeah, I mean, and there's a famous quote from Margaret Atwood, which says, I have nothing against the head, nothing against the body, I have everything against the neck, which gives the idea that somehow they're separate. Yeah. So, but this is what you're talking about, right? Can you explain it's, it's a little Cartesian. bit more Cartesian dualism? Oh, mind over body, mind. right? Yeah. I mean, Cartesian dualism is quite trenchant in the university. Yeah. As kinesiologists, yeah. I'm not playing a victim card here, yeah. but kinesiologists are stigmatized, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. So, and, and I often, I, I, I kind of like the underdog label. Yeah. I quite embrace it. Yeah. So, and I've experienced it as a, a faculty member, but also as a graduate oh, student. Sure. When people, when, when my colleagues would ask if I completely understood the assigned reading in one of my graduate classes because they were aware that I was in kinesiology or human kinetics, it wasn't time. Yeah. It's very uh, patronizing. Yeah. Uh, but I, 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 I kind of play with it ironically. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, frankly, I don't really give a shit. Yeah. But I also, I'm, I think it's also what connects us with our students. The mm -hmm. stigma of the kinese student, right? Yeah. So when we aren't wearing sweatpants, we are blowing minds. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so, if yeah. You walk, so when I walk into a class and I'm wearing a suit and not, you know, a pair of fleece pants that say horns across the ass, yeah. sometimes people are like, wait a second. This is Cadiz? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's no reason why Cadiz students and, and people that are, you know, into sports can't be 
cerebral. Yeah. Academic. Right? Yeah. But we still wear it, right? Yeah. yeah. You maybe you experience it when you when you go to different psychology departments, right? Mm -hmm. Or you do sports psychology. You probably do sports psych light. Yeah. If I'm a sports sociologist, I go into a sociology department. Oh, really? Okay. So you do sociology light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. No, no, not really. Yeah. It, it is the stigma. And it, it's it all. I mean, that that is Cartesian dualism. Yeah. Really. Right? Yeah. Oh, you're just into muscles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I find though it's interesting with that connection because I find that being in shape yeah. gives credibility to your students to want to listen to you. Okay. So I okay, like a trainer, like a nobody, or or like a skinny chef. Is it the skinny <laughs> chef syndrome? Yeah. Never eat food from a skinny chef. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. I, but I, I find that if. My thought was if I'm in sports tech, I need to look like someone who's in sports tech. Right? Okay. So when okay. they so they look at me and they go, okay, well he's not just an outsider studying sports. Right. He he can play sport. Right. 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 You're not just an egghead. As yeah. Guy. Yeah. Right. And I find yeah. that in doing sports like research, if you don't, especially in hockey, if you don't look the part and sound the part, they just shut you out. You're done. Don't do. Yeah. Much. You're you're yeah, kind of study. It seems like you're in a bit of a liminal area, right? Mm. Right, <laughs> right. Mm. Uh, in the sense that you need this. This is body idiom. This yeah. is often right. This yeah. is social construction of the body. Yeah. Uh, you need to look a certain way to gain capital. Yeah. In sports, right? Yeah. So yeah. if you come in, uh, you know, looking like Noam Chomsky. Yeah. And you're going to tell a bunch of athletes how to do things, and you'd be like, "Have you ever shot a puck?" Yeah. Yeah. You probably hasn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but. On the other hand, if you were to look like Noam Chomsky and you went to a, an academic conference, mm -hmm. people wouldn't bat an eye. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you need to, you, you need to, yeah. you're straddling two different yeah, worlds yeah. here. Thread that uh, right. needle. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. where I found as the bulky guy, yeah. I couldn't do it. Interesting. Whereas the athletic, slim guy, yeah. I could go into sport and back into Interesting. academia. Interesting. Yeah. Now you dress up when you lecture as well. Yes, I do. Yeah. So I wear a dress shirt, I wear dress pants. And I didn't start doing it, actually. When my first semesters, I wore Lululemon, like everything. And the okay. students used to tease me about it. Yeah. But uh, I actually noticed two things. Um, one was that students would just swear in front of me. Oh, really? Yeah. But not like calling me names or anything, but yeah. when they tell me a story, like, I'd friends. ask them, yeah, how the weekend's going. I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, I went to it. <laughs> I'm like, man, when I was in school, there's yeah. no way I was swearing right, in front right, of my prof, right? right? right. Yeah. So, and I mean, I'm pretty open, laid back yeah. guy, so I yeah. invite students and, to be themselves. And your appearance is yeah. far removed from your students. Yes. Yeah, so you I'm don't like, have a yeah. gray beard. Yes, yeah. I look, yeah. I can't even grow up. <laughs> yeah. But then I put on the, on the dress clothes yeah. and then, it, I think, created a little bit of degree, yeah, degree of separation. Absolutely, um, absolutely. And they're still open, but a few less f bombs. Yeah. And so I've I've now gone into dress, you know, more professional. Yeah. So I and I think yeah. part of that was the age thing. I had to age myself a little with my with my clothing. Right. Which I guess ties into the representation of the. Body, yeah, absolutely, right? absolutely. So I mean, yeah. yeah. If I were to, you know. If I walked into class with a Nickelback t-shirt, the students <laughs> might think of me differently than when I normally walk in with a tweed suit on. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's it. You know what? There's Maybe another... just point to the door if I walk into yeah. a Nickelback shirt. Right? Oh, uh, yeah, that's another uh, confessional. You know, some, some Nickelback songs get me going. <laughs> <laughs> there was a meme. Uh, this was the federal election two cycles ago. Yeah. And there was a picture of Chad Kruger with Stephen Harper. Yeah. And the meme said, remember. A vote for Harper is a vote for Nickelback. <laughs> it's pretty funny. But I, I completely understand yeah. about the, 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 the style and the dress, right? Yeah. So I started dressing in a suit and tie. Yeah. Early in my career, it was to provide a more uh, a, a visual separation between myself and the students. And it does, yeah. it raises everyone's game, I think, as well. Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of comfortability yeah. in the class. Yeah. But I think when, through dress, you can elevate the intellectual conversations in some ways, obviously not on its own, yeah. in and of itself. Yeah. And I don't mean dressing like a banker, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like a lot of our rural students, when they see a banker, they're like, you're here to take my dad's land, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you can't, you can't walk in there like, you can't walk in like a dean. And yeah. like, hey, I'm gonna have a great conversation with yeah. my students. Yeah, yeah. So I strategically dress in ways that would suggest that I'm not on Bay Street. 
Yeah. Or on Wall Street. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I dress a little poorly, if you will. Yeah. Bring out the tweet. So in some cases, I'm trying to play the academic role. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. This, uh, there was a guy, I think it was the University of Calgary, named Bob Stebbins, and he, he studied um, aspiring doctors, med students. Mm -hmm. And what he found was one of the most important things that med students learn in med school is not the, about the body. It's not about diagnostics. <laughs> It's about acting like a doctor. Yeah. So it's about bedside manner in yeah. some ways, but it's also about presenting yourself as the person that knows, right? Yeah. So in some cases, we kind of, whether we're always conscious of it or not, we become the professor that, that, mm -hmm. we, that we learn from. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. We, we, act like, we act like the way we're supposed to act. Yeah. Even though we always said, I'm never going to be like that. I'm never going to be like my parents. Right? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Become your parents. You're like, what the hell happened? Yeah, I know. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm never going to be that prof who wears the corduroy blazer with the yellow patches. Yeah. Here I am. Yeah, right? for sure. You're just going to fall into these roles. For sure. But yeah, you start, I find when you start with imposter syndrome and then yeah, you just you yeah. pick up the cues and learn. Absolutely. Essentially Absolutely. how to behave. What would you think though? You, you talk about how you, you teach that the body is socially constructed. Yeah. I, so myself, I kind of took that and I do it often too, is if I'm in a new scenario, I take a second and I stay quiet and I learn the social expectations okay. and how you're supposed to behave and whatever. And then I read the room and then I can, yeah, I'm still myself, but I know how far to push it. Right. Right. And the same yeah. thing with, with academia. So I learned, you know, you probably should dress this way. Yeah. You're going to want to talk this way. Yeah. Yeah drop a few last F-bombs, right? Yeah, right, <laughs> right? Right, So yeah. you, you learn how to speak. You, I, I, I say that like I would put on an academic mask, right? Mm -hmm. Would you recommend learning what it is and adapting to it or fighting against it, right? Because part of my lesson is I always say learn, or when I'm giving advice, sometimes I say, learn the rules of the game yeah. and then play to win. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a question that I think you can answer that in a variety of ways. Yeah. I think, oh man. I think the rules, some people don't have a choice and they can't actually fit the rules. Yeah. Some are quite skilled at manipulating the rules. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking of like in post-colonial studies, there's an article by a guy by the name of Homi Baba who talks about this idea of colonial mimicry, yeah. of fitting in by, and it's not a form of assimilation, it's actually quite a disruptive practice, but by mimicking the, cult, the colonizer, right? Yeah. By, by speaking English, by reading Shakespeare, by eating fish and chips, whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, so th this idea of the mimic man, it's possible and it can be advantageous, but for some, the standard is always out of reach. Yeah. So when you think about uh, language mm -hmm. and the myth of the, this, this, well, it's not, the standard language movement based upon the myth of a standard English. Yeah. So when someone says, I can't understand you, you're not speaking English, even though the English is perfectly fine, it just has, happens to have an accent. Yeah. And all English has accents, right? Um, the idea of, okay, fit in, act the part, it is a, it, it's an assimilationist yeah. impulse. And I, I know you're not talking specifically about multicultural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I guess what I'm trying to say is sometimes the ability to adapt is the product of privilege that is not equally distributed. Yeah. And sometimes it's a product of adaptation. Yeah. Of, of the um, one is compelled to adapt or, or die. Yeah. Right? So you learn to fake it. Yeah. Or otherwise you're, you'll never be in, in that club. Yeah. Yeah. So. And I, find, I found that with academia was you come in and then. I would learn to speak the yeah, academic yeah, speak, yeah. which would then grant you a seat at the table, right. which then could allow you to fall back to just who you were. Once, once you Precisely. show that, hey guys, I can yeah. do this too, but now let's just be yeah. human. Fake it until you make it. Right? Yeah. But it, it got you into the door, but then, so if I just open with casual speak and whatever, then maybe I don't get a seat at the table. Right. But if I opened and showed that I can be an academic too, I understand yeah, what you're yeah. talking about, and you know yeah. we have the same experiences yeah. here. Okay, now I'm part of the club, um, and now we could just be humans. And right. then you revert right. back to, and right. you both destroy this facade, and then right. you're just back to right. two people who grew up in small towns yeah, or whatever, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So I wonder, uh, 
with that advice. So at what stage do you feel comfortable enough to revert back? I would say you're not necessarily reverting back to your old self. You just have no. multiple selves, right? Yeah. When we talk about identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. And you so, carry that core across it. Yeah. Then you, it's just the yeah. boundaries aren't maintained yeah. with such fixity, right? Yeah. So yeah. you can drop a few F-bombs in the classroom or, yeah. or at a faculty meeting yeah. and get away with it because yeah, yeah. you've proven yourself, right? Yeah. You've passed the ranks. Yeah. yeah. And I think yeah. just, you know, if you're talking with, uh, you know, a big shot in research, yeah, it always starts really formal and academic yeah. and then yeah. degrades yeah. within, you know, yeah. 10 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. And then you're, yeah. okay. Very few people are able to maintain that scholarly rigid yeah. rigidity right? yeah 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 and if they maintain it you're kind of like okay maybe this person is always like that yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't want to talk to you yeah, we're not yeah. going to go for coffee yeah right? you're not that interesting yeah. Yeah. so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. yeah but i do find that funny that there's that uh everyone feels like an imposter because you don't speak the same way but then you yeah. go and replicate it and make others feel like an imposter right so then this is part of yeah. part of why I'm doing this is is trying to show, hey, it's just human beings and yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean yeah. the question that you're asking is actually it's, it's multidimensional. Yeah. And it really is in some cases an an, an, an ontological question, an yeah. epistemological question. What counts as research, right? Yeah. So do I have to go out and do empirical research so that I can prove myself in your eyes? Yeah. Or can I just get away with get away? with doing theoretical discussions. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what, what counts as valid research is basically, this is how we can branch this question off, yeah. right? So it's not just about speaking a certain tongue yeah. or wearing a tie or sitting in a particular type of compartment. Yeah. It's also about the type of research that is done. Oh, yeah. you do sports psychology? Oh, okay. Huh. Yeah. Maybe you should publish in some psych journals and then we'll talk. Yeah. I'm being facetious, of course, but this well, is, this I've, is kind I've of had those conversations too. Oh, yeah. Some people are publishing in, in impact factors of 20. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, our best journal is three, yeah. and it has a 95% rejection rate. So you're telling there you me go. Yeah. that my three is not good as The impact factor is based on incestuous citation. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, yeah. So I find that, yeah, a larger field just makes everyone in that field look better. Right. But I find right. it interesting, too, where we could sit down and write a paper yeah. on what we're talking about right now. We publish it, and it's worth something. We have this conversation, and let's say this podcast goes big and blows yeah. up, reaches a hundred thousand people. Right, it's not worth as much as right. a paper read by three. Right, right. yeah. But the yeah. same ideas are discussed. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, the venue matters, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And in some cases, the the, the merit of one venue is entirely arbitrary. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> it is strange. Yeah. yeah. So if we come back into the classroom now, so yeah. one of your first lessons is is talking about how it is socially constructed. What else yeah. do you cover in, there, in that course? Uh, we talk about, so we have, we start off mm. with this sociology of the body, different yeah. approaches. We talk about how the interest of, how the sociological interest in the body yeah. is relatively new. It really didn't start until the 1960s with various feminist movements, um, the aging body, the baby boomers, yeah. uh, the crisis in defining the body with virtual technology, so on and so forth. Mm. And then we talk, we, we sort of branch out into culture. We talk about yeah. pop culture. Yeah. So we spend a bit of time talking about literary representations of the body. Yeah. We we'll talk about the theories of Mikhail Bakhtin, the carnival yeah. the celebration of grotesque realism, yeah. fat bodies, of feces, of piss, cum. Mm -hmm. We talk about our, the, the extent of When I bring this up, I always talk about a turd on the desk. Yeah. And the response of the students illustrates the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah. So my, my, it's always imaginary, this situation. <laughs> if you walk into the classroom and there's a turd on the desk, what are you going to do? Yeah. You're not going to that fucking classroom. You're leaving. <laughs> but I tell them, the turd is not going to kill you. Why did you just leave? Yeah. And we talk about boundaries, yeah. inside, outside, sacred, profane. Yeah. So in talking about things like grotesque realism, we try to unpack the ways in which things that are otherwise natural to our bodies, yeah. when they become, as Mary Douglas says, matter out of place yeah. they cause social problems they cause yeah. psychological problems right yeah the sacred and profane it doesn't matter what we consider sacred what we consider profane. they just mm -hmm. need to be separated right yeah so once you have the breakdown of those boundaries you have the breakdown of the social order okay so mm -hmm. when we, we do spend a bit of time talking about something that julia first David calls the abject these things that haunt the healthy development of identity yeah and the, the healthy subject is based upon this clear separation between self and other right yeah, yeah but things like poop and pee are always a bit troublesome because we're 
they are a part of us, but yeah. they're not a part of us, right? So that, that, and we can never get rid of them. Yeah. We poop every day, yeah. but we do it again and again and again, right? So it's interesting that you, you mentioned that because I see that a lot in, in aging research, right? Oh, yeah. So sure. it's actually one of, it's a strange ism, right? So you have sexism, you have yeah. racism, and you have ageism, yeah. right? But it's very unique in the sense that it's the only ism where you are an in group and then become an out group. Mm. Right? So you grow up young, yeah. which is um, put in the spotlight. It's very positive, yeah. right? We look yeah. at young bodies as very um, beneficial, yeah, as something sure. that's valuable, sure. and old sure. bodies are not, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you spend the majority of your life in this young body, yeah. and then eventually you become an outgroup member. Right. You become old. Yeah. Right. And yeah. what they see. I wouldn't I don't know if I would call it an outgroup necessarily. I would say that the construction of that body changes. Yes. So you're not an outgroup when it, in terms of the advertising community. Yes. Right? Yes. You become a different target. Yes. So all of a sudden Cialis is your thing. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So when you turn on the television and you watch gossip girl, you're like, where are the old people? Yeah. Wait to the commercial when you go to TLC or whatever. <laughs> you're everywhere. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So you may be an outgroup in terms of certain representations, yeah. but you're also constructed as a problem yeah. in other narratives. But the, the funny thing that you tend to see is that when like, when you're doing these implicit bias, bias tests, right? Yeah. Typically, you'll see races have a preference for their own race, okay. right? But what happens with age is there's always a preference for young. Okay. So because they've been young for their whole life, yeah. even when they're old, they show the preference for young. Right. But they're no longer young anymore. Right. So there's right. this dissonance between what they okay. think is okay. positive and yeah. important, yeah. but what they are now. Right. And they used to be there. Yeah. So yeah. I study master's athletes who are highly physically active. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're very, they are a very privileged population. They yeah. tend to have a lot of money. So they're deemed successful agers. Mm -hmm. and what we tend to see is a black sheep effect. Right, so they're very proud to be masters athletes okay. because it defies the stigmas of aging and lets them stay within this in group right. of being right. young, fit, yeah. healthy body. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And what they what they'll do is they have this uh, negative perception of old faces and right. old bodies. Right. right? right. Sure. So sure. I'm aging, but I'm a masters athlete. I'm not one of them. Yeah. So they push. Yeah other views yeah. in yeah. other groups of older individuals. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, the, there's, a, there's a nice overlap yeah. between yeah. what you're discussing and yeah. the themes of social constructions of the body. Yeah. The stigmatization of wrinkles, scars, yeah. flab. Right? Yeah. yeah. And when they see these bodies that aren't young looking, yeah. young looking yeah. older bodies, yeah. they say, that's not me. Right. Right. And they, right. they're very right. protective of their master's yeah. athlete identity yeah, 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 yeah. because it allows them to sort of stay within that. Okay. Okay. So, Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just uh, ties. Huh. Yeah, the aging body is quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in a variety of ways. Uh, a question that I often ask my students is, when was the last time you saw old people fuck? <laughs> 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 On screen, yeah. not in person. Yeah. And I don't say fuck. Mm -hmm. Maybe I do. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and I'm not talking, my yeah. qualifier is, I'm not talking about some kinky niche porn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about in popular culture, when was the last time you saw an and two aging bodies <laughs> make love, and they're well, they, they can't come yeah, up with yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. But some of them come up with some corny like Judd Apatow film or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. And it's like, right, that's my point. There's so not, when you yeah. see old people fuck, <laughs> it's supposed to be a site of comedy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They don't do the useless three-minute sex scene in the movie. Right. Between two right. eighty-year-old. Exactly. Old. Exactly. Yeah. Because because old bodies are supposed to be non-productive. Yeah. Non and asexual, right? Yeah. There's actually a similar discussion between aging bodies and, and disabled bodies as well. Yeah. Right? This idea that, oh, you're, you're, you don't have the same desires. So we, not desire. we draw a lot of parallels with, with uh, the disabled body literature as well. Okay. Right? To try yeah. and understand the concepts yeah. with adult support. Yeah. Right? Because there's they're going through this concept now where they're super competitive. Right. But they're not allowed to be because uh, they're old. Okay. Right, so they're yeah, older, yeah. so so they'll be reticent in in speaking about their competitive orientation. Okay. okay. Right? So, so huh. you'll ask them, and they'll say, "Hey, do you care about winning?" No, it's all about fun, friendship, and and all these things they're told they're supposed yeah, to do yeah, sport yeah. for, yeah. right? And social activities, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, 
yet you watch them and they're at their banquet and they're wearing their medals, <laughs> right? So yeah. if you don't care about competition, right. why are you wearing right. your medal yeah. as an 80 year old yeah. to a banquet, Yeah, right? <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Yeah, so, so we see a lot of parallels there on how, and trying to make it okay to be competitive right. as right. an older adult yeah. and trying to be okay with the master's competition. Right. Right. Yeah. Can I take a bathroom break? Yeah, you can, for sure. I had too much water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so come back into it. Yeah. So we were just talking about aging. Um, well, what, what got us into that? Um, I'm talking about social construction of the body, the course. Oh, the feces. <laughs> yeah. The poop. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the course does talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. um, there's so, a range of subjects. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. No, I was just going to. Yeah, I mean, we, we try to approach, or I try to introduce the students to a range of approaches or uh, theories mm -hmm. and philosophies surrounding the body. And mm -hmm. one of the, I find it enjoyable because yeah. I, I, there's a nice shock value to the yeah. grotesque. Yeah. And, and it's everywhere, and yet it's never, or it's never, students don't often get a chance to intellectualize it or think critically about yeah. why it is that we find bodily fluids so gross when mm. are, there's, there's nothing more natural, really. Mm. So it's important to think about the different representations or non-representations of yeah. these things, like scars, wrinkles, yeah. you know, the signs of decay yeah. of the aging body are seen as taboo. Yeah. So this would get to your, this, this outgroup type thing that you're talking about, right? Yeah. But in other ways, it's, it's pathologized. We, we have to remove it. We have to get it out of sight. Yeah. And the only way we see these, the only spaces in which these bodies are allowed to be is when they're problematized, right? Yeah. In, in pharmaceutical advertisements. Yeah. That is the dominant realm of representing aging and, and old bodies, yeah. which is really problematic. Yeah, there's some studies that are out there, and uh, they looked at birthday cards. Okay. And I think it was something like 90% of all birthday call cards for people above a certain age yeah. are negative representation. Interesting. Of age, Interesting. right? Huh. So they talk about, you know, like losing cognition. Yeah. Or, and yeah. They're, they're usually satirical. Right. right. And, right. and then they do certain studies on cartoons and depictions of older people. Okay. And it's all, almost always negative too, right? Mm. So in my class, I always show the classic Simpsons article. There's, uh, who was the grandpa? I can't remember his name, but Grandpa Simpson. Abe. Right? Yeah, Abe, yeah. yeah. So it's the classic uh, newspaper article. Or which one says, old man yells at cloud, right? And then there's Dr. Yeah. Fonsworth, Futurama. Right. So you right. always have right. that senile old man yeah. that, yeah. Uh, yeah. and it's usually done in a way that is supposed to be funny. Right. Right? Yeah. So when we yeah. typically look at ageism versus sexism and yeah. racism, it's usually on the lighter end. It's usually poking fun. It's yeah. not yeah. as overt. Yeah. And it's more widely accepted. Sure. Sure. Right? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Sometimes they intersect, right? Yeah. I mean, in terms of Hollywood, yeah. ageism and sexism. Yeah. Right? The idea of, uh, and it ties into your, your, Discussion of the master's athletes, yeah. to a certain extent. The idea of, of the the old female actor, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and how uh, a, a certain percentage of roles only go to yeah. the young actors. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas the old man can get by. Yeah. All right. Yeah. For yeah. a while, anyways. Yeah. 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 So, anything, any other topics that you cover that you think are worth uh, discussing here? Uh, how, how are you finding the pandemic, man? Yeah, <laughs> like isolation. I mean, there's a whole. I think you could have you could have a whole podcast just talking about how not just our lives have changed, but how if we've been privileged enough to reflect upon our own experiences at work, yeah, and in terms of research in quarantine, yeah, what does it, what does our work mean now? Yeah, or six months ago, what would it mean in six months? Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's uh. It was, I found a couple things. Have you been productive? And what does, productive, what does productivity mean when people don't have jobs, when people are dying? Yeah. I don't mean to be no, gross. But. No, I, well, I mean, I kind of had a reflection on the importance of right. my research right, right. now. Right. Where I'm thinking, all right, maybe, maybe funding dollars need to go elsewhere for yeah. a couple of years, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that was kind of a bit of an eye opener. I've also seen 
and I think there'll be some value there, but the classic researcher adapting to the time and picking the low hanging fruit. Yeah. So I've seen a lot of the productive and highly productive now yeah. have shifted and are studying the lived experience of 14 year olds with COVID and, okay. and yeah. you know, volleyball. Right. So if I wanted to publish, so it's a niche market now. COVID. Well, yeah. So if yeah. I wanted to publish right now, it'd be a very good thing. I could, I would study university athletes experience right. in, in right. the COVID right. lockdown. Yeah. 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 With the, uh, you know, how did that impact their identity and right. beliefs and thoughts about sport? Yeah. I think low hanging fruit is probably a good description yeah. for that. And, yeah. and I mean, I don't want to be insulting people doing that research. I'm sure there's some good yeah, stuff, but I, yeah. it's one that I'm avo- I'm just not going to play that one right yeah, now. I'm yeah. going to let I just sit this one out. Some people will find some really important things. My yeah, own yeah. topic doesn't lend lend itself too well for. This. It would seem gimmicky if, yes. you, if you squeezed it, right? Yes. Yeah. Leadership yeah, in a pandemic. I just, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So I'm going to sit out for this one. I think that's okay. Yeah. I think that's okay. And I've been, so in the world of productivity, I've been fortunate that I'm a co-editor right now of a book. Okay. So during this year, I'm going to have six products or so. Yeah. I have a bunch yeah. of, so I'm just writing book chapters. Right. So this yeah. would be the year I'd say for reviews and systematic reviews and book chapters yeah. to get those out where you, where you don't have access to data. Right. Or you can't be collecting yeah, data. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I've been yeah, doing it definitely that. affects it. For so sure. I I would say I've been productive for sure in terms just because I was fortunate enough that this was the year I was right. writing books and right. book chapters, right? Right. right. Yeah. Where if I had yeah. been a data collection year, I'd have been screwed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I find life wise, it was very different. Mm-hmm. I had talked about it in my last podcast that's coming out. Uh, we were talking about mental health, mm-hmm. and I was at the point where I was kind of working so much and doing so much that I was staving off panic attacks mm. and with the birth of Katie and then the pandemic, yeah. I was forced out of my additional roles beyond teaching okay. and then summer came yeah. and I kind of yeah. had a, had a reflexive period where I looked at my life. I said, what's important here? Why am I pushing myself that far? Yeah. yeah. So I've actually stepped back a little bit and started to do things such as a podcast, which I get pleasure out of, yeah. but don't necessarily yeah. count. Yeah, right? I don't think, yeah, you don't have to, I think the word is rendering. You don't always have to render all of your life experiences into a publication. Yeah. yeah. Right? There's, 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 yeah. Much to be, there's much to be said and critiqued, I think, about the productivist mentality. Yeah. Right? Not only how we define productivity, but just the idea of productivity. Mm-hmm. We don't have to be productive. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. it's easy to say as a tenured yeah. professor, but I, th- I think we need to reevaluate that. And yeah. in some cases, I think the pandemic is, has encouraged that. But that, I mean, the pand- the COVID is only one pandemic, yeah. right? That we're talking about over the summer. Yeah. I mean, the Black Lives Matter, the George Floyd, the Breonna mm-hmm. Taylor, Breonna Taylor. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's it's been a political pandemic, it seems mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. It's just, I mean, early. It was the quarantine, it was Trump, it was uh, police brutality, you mm-hmm. know, there was so much going on that I, I wouldn't say I had a crisis of confidence in terms of research, but I felt like this is a time to just, just shut the fuck up and listen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nobody needs to hear another white guy talk about race or mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. So just, I, I, found, I found myself being really productive in the, in the early, maybe month and a half, yeah. and then I just kind of shut it down. Yeah. And just just read for the sake of reading. Yeah. And and early I was consuming way too much CNN, yeah. BBC, Al Jazeera, CBC, too much. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. it was I was becoming a poor man's Howard Hughes. Yeah. Shuttled up in the basement. <laughs> but um yeah, I, I just found I, I think it's encouraging a lot of introspection. Yeah. In terms of what we think the normal was mm-hmm. and what a return to normal might mean mm-hmm. and if a return to normal is even desirable. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it pushed me into rethinking my class. Sure. To the point where I've done now a flipped classroom. Okay. Where I post my lecture online. Okay. And I'm going to see how it goes. It might be a failure. But then what I'm going to do is meet with students. So you watch oh. the lecture and then yeah. let's just talk like we're talking now. Okay. 
What's testable is online. Yep. This is for actual growth mm. and for looking at, you know, beyond, because, you know, when we, well, when I teach a lot of sports site concepts, it's yeah. as if they're perfect. Right. 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 Just so yeah. that people can grasp them. Yeah. It's hard yeah. to teach. So how are you meeting with them? So I'm going to meet on Zoom. Okay. Um, and I'll see how that goes. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it's something I'm going to carry forward. If it fails here, I'm, I might try it in person too, where I no longer lecture in class. I meet with you and we talk and debate and, and so if, uncover rocks. So if and when yeah. we resume to in-class format, would you just set aside, would you just do like, you'd still have, a, have an assigned lecture time, but you'd meet yeah. with the students for 10 no. minute blocks? No, I would, I'd have an assigned lecture time. Yeah. And, and only those who are interested okay. are coming to my class. Okay. It's not mandatory. Okay. Nothing we talk about in the class in that classroom yep. is testable. Okay, just the material that's posted. Just the material that's posted. And then you would have additional and then I would personalized start, office yeah. hours. And then I would start in that classroom and I would go over what people didn't understand. Okay. You can leave after that. And then I would get into the weeds and talk about where the field's going, what are some of the problems, yeah. what people thought and felt. And yeah. then, then you'd have more of a captured audience. So you'd have the 20 that yep. care beyond their GPA yeah. who come to class right. and I have more interesting conversations and I can push people to a limit without having that extreme focus on GPA. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, I, I hear that, that on my the last part for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some issues that might arise might relate to labor. <laughs> yeah. How much that's going to take out of you. Yeah. Right. In terms of hours, but yeah. also sometimes the, the students don't even know that they're turned on. Yeah. Okay, so I like the idea. I yeah. think it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for me, some of the students don't really have much of an interest in the course until I talk about shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very few students yeah. have that. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Yeah. So they wouldn't know. If it was an optional class, they wouldn't show up in the first place. Yeah. So, and, and I think we're similar in the yeah. sense that so much of the, when we think we're interesting, it works. Yeah. We, we always think we're more interested yeah. than we yeah. are, but. Lecturing is so important. The in-person, the immersive experience yeah. is so critical to our pedagogy, right? Yeah. yeah. That, that, yeah. I mean, I don't know how you loop the students in that don't come from the outset. Yeah. You know so, I mean? I mean, they would just be exposed to me lecturing on the material. Yeah. In yeah. a Zoom, like a recorded Zoom right. format. Right. Right. Okay. So, you do have some. So, yeah. I would give my, I give my lecture and I film myself giving right. it. Right. And they, would wa they could watch that. Yeah. And, you know, in there, I'm telling my jokes. I don't have yeah. any interaction with the student, which yeah, that's isn't what I'm nearly as fun. Yeah. Um, but then if they, if they wanted to know more and interact with that material beyond testable yeah. portions, they'd yeah. come to the classroom. Sure. Sure. And then we talk about real things, like right now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And you could ask questions in front of a smaller group. Instead of being 60 in the classroom, yeah. now you're 20. Yeah. So you're a bit more comfortable. That might be the way and, forward. In and terms the, of yeah. And then in the conversation, there's um, an encouragement to make mistakes because nothing is testable. Right. 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 In that. Yeah. It's just. A yeah. Con yeah. Yeah. Let's learn. And I think. Push uh, me. Right. Yeah. By default, you have small class. Yeah. Sure. And more more of a captivated audience. Yeah. So it's yeah. selfish on my perspective. Yeah. You would essentially be turning that into a seminar yes. without the grading scheme. Yes. So, yeah. But those who only need the class to graduate and don't like sports psych and yeah. have no, yeah. they have all the material, they've got it all, everything presented to them. Yeah. They could get 100 in the class. Yeah. Yeah. The classroom experience would be for those who just want to challenge themselves and push beyond the material. So you're thinking of this in future semesters, yes, I'm not in, the fall. I'm trying it in the fall. On oh, you're trying June, in the fall. Okay. okay. Which might be yeah. a failure. Yeah. But even in person, I might try the flip classroom. Okay. So we'll see how that goes. Let me know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the fall will be interesting, that's for sure. Yeah. I did record my lectures. I just did narration. Yeah. I didn't do any video or images. Mm -hmm. They're still they're big files, hey? Yeah, they're huge. Yeah, so I posted them on Moodle. Yeah. And uh, they're just like the PowerPoint. Ones. So yeah. we'll see how that goes. Yeah. It's kind of like bankable hours, right? Yeah. Like the work is done, so just consider that your lecture, your lecturing is basically done. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll do the synchronous component. I think is just going to be the Moodle discussion forum. I'll yeah. Use that. Yeah. 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 It, it will be interesting. I mean, I'm going to miss it for sure. Oh yeah. 
wow. just being in this class. Is hard. Yeah, it, it, it really is. It really is. Even even when you have a shitty lecture, it's still better than yeah. <laughs> talking to your computer. I know. Yeah. yeah. And then just as So are you doing so what classes are you teaching in the fall? Sports psychology and then aging physical activity. Is the aging one a seminar? Fourth year? No. No, third year? It's it's a fourth year, but I don't do seminar. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's a uh, I'm gonna do the same. How many students? Twenty. Okay. Yeah. So there's usually a good conversation. Yeah. And then yeah. And then we do a lot of uh, student web projects. Yeah, I have that in my fourth year seminar. So half of my classes is the basics. So yeah. I talk, I talk about some of the material, even even the idea of the aging body and being yeah. an in group yeah. versus out group. Yeah. I talk a little bit about how, the impact of uh, older adults on the healthcare system, um, impact of physical activity and yeah. sport, and yeah. how sport might be a special avenue okay. to get people more involved in physical activity mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. to be one way to fight the, I guess the whole obesity uh, pandemic or that problem that we're facing mm -hmm. and problems mm -hmm. with cardiovascular disease. So just giving them an alternative option and trying to demystify sport and say that it's okay as an aging person to stay in sport because that's a huge cohort that just drops off. Yeah. Sports, yeah. You're too old now. Yeah. Sports for young people where physical activity yeah. is for everyone. Right. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what are your numbers like? I haven't checked. You said there's 20? In Usually there's 20. I oh, don't know okay. what my numbers okay. are like. Yeah. Mine are a little bit lower. Yeah. My fourth year class is full. Yeah. The third year class is about half. Yeah. So there's 25. I yeah. Think, 20 or something. Yeah. yeah. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. I, yeah. So, uh, I'm more or less worried about the, the collapse of that. You talk about these boundaries and maintaining boundaries. What happens when our home becomes our office? Yeah, That's what I'm worried about. No. I'm never, once, once work is done, you're never going to find me in front of my television again. Yeah. My office is right in front of my yeah. television. But yeah, I'm worried about that. So I I've, don't like that. Either. I've compartmentalized my home. Okay. Yeah. You so have I, to. You so have I to. have in the basement, I have a green screen and a, lo like a locked-in office. Oh, okay. And then I have my gym, yeah. which is behind it. Yeah. And then I don't, I'm not allowed to go down into the basement unless I'm working or working. Out. Okay. So when I come upstairs, I'm done. Good. And I don't, nice. I, I don't keep, I keep my laptop down there. I keep my desktop down there. I keep, yeah. that's it. I'm it's done. Good. So it's if, good. unless I'm in the basement, I'm not working out or working. Yeah. You're laughing. Yeah. Uh, I don't have, that, we don't have that kind of space. Well, we had, we had it in our guest room before. Your and, office? Yeah. Yeah. And then it just bled into my life. Right. Right. Yeah. It starts with the phone and the, and the email. Yeah. And then it, once the pandemic sets in, it's, mm -hmm. it's the space now, right? Yeah. It's no longer virtual. Yeah. It's dangerous. I don't like it. And the expectation is that you're always on call. Yeah. yeah. No. No thanks. And, and the perception is that you work less, even though you work yeah. more. Absolutely. We're yeah. always on. If your house is your office, you tend to work more. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're always at work. Right. So. Right. Yeah. yeah, I don't like that. No. So usually I think uh, we're winding down. So who's doing good research right now that, you, that you're reading or into? Okay. I, I like, he's not a sport sociologist yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. He doesn't talk about sport. I like the work of David, a guy named David McNally. Okay. He used to be at York. I think he's at the University of Houston now. He does a lot of stuff on like cultural studies mm -hmm. and uh, the economy, uh, the great recession. Mm -hmm. He does a lot of stuff in terms of Marxism. There's also another guy who sort of overlaps. Um, Nick Dyer Witherford. He's part of this tradition. I don't know if he would actually describe him as a part of the tradition. Uh, autonomous Marxism. I did a lot of reading over the summer yeah. about uh, the uh, autonomous Marxists of Italy in the 1970s, 60s and 70s and about this kind of rejection of productionism, which we were talking yeah. about earlier. Yeah, yeah. So I did a lot of reading about, uh, I, yeah, what is her name? Um, I wrote a, wrote a book, I read a book about the anti-work movement and this idea of post-work. Her name is Kathy Weeks. Mm -hmm. So she talks about the importance of a universal basic income. Yeah. She talks about, she provides a critique of not just capitalism, but the ways in which unions have bought into Productivism as well and Marxism as well. So the idea here is to actually reward the worker. Yeah. 
without actually questioning what the whole thing is about in the first place. Yeah. We, we don't have to be productive. Yeah. So um, it, was, it was kind of a, it was a great book to read yeah. over the summer. Do you think that our, we're heading there? Is this the, you know, the final um, catalyst that breaks it or? Heading in terms of? Into going into the uh, value of non-productivity. Or... I don't think we're there. Because in part because we're being right? forced back to work. Yeah. yeah. Because but we got, been forced. we've been given the taste of, let's yeah. not call it universal basic income because it's oh, not yeah, quite it's far that. From that. Yeah. But the CERB, some people yeah. may have, may be looking now. And, and there's some people who are paid more. Oh, for sure. Than they were making when they were working. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the depravities of capitalism have never been more exposed and, and uh, glaring mm. than they are now. Yeah. At least in terms of recent. Yeah. Um, crises if you yeah. will yeah i think there's hope among the rubble mm. right now mm. if, if you it depends on what you how you get your news and what you're following and how you engage with social media right yeah. it's very easy to get in get into uh an echo chamber yeah where you only read about bad shit you only yeah. read about possibility you only yeah. read about god knows what you know mm. um yeah i think there's some reason to be hopeful about mm. a range of things yeah but there's also i mean it's obviously going to take a lot of work yeah. And a lot of persistence and fighting yeah. in our province and, and beyond, right? Yeah. And I think, uh, I think a lot of the current movement stems from that. There's an underlying inequity caused by yeah. Yeah. capitalism. Yeah. And I, I don't know whether it'll come through because right now there's a big focus on race, but yeah. intertwined yeah. with that is the capitalist. Oh, for sure. Yeah, the capitalist system, right? Yep. yep. So inequities in the past are maintained through a capitalistic structure that right. keeps the top on the top and the bottom on the yeah. bottom. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people, I find it interesting, the, uh, you know, how Nike will be super, you know, anti-racist, right? Yeah. Yeah. They'll, po yeah. they'll post on Instagram, but then they'll never talk about raising minimum wage, or which will help more people. Right, of right? course. So of course. They, would, they would rather have... Raising minimum wage doesn't yeah. sell t-shirts. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and, Colin Kaepernick yeah. does. Yeah, and they would rather have you know one person, let's bring up one person of color and put them on the board of direct yeah. Uh, yeah. directors. Yeah, tokenism, classic right? tokenism. And then, and then let's say how progressive we are, and we've raised one person yeah. and their salary. Let's say they pay them $10 million a year, yeah. cost them yeah. $10 million. But if they were to raise minimum wage by, you know, two dollars, it would right. cost them billions, right? Yeah. And they would help so many more people Absolutely. by just changing Absolutely. the pay structure. Absolutely. I think I read a, a quote from I don't know what social media said. I can't even remember who said it, but it was something along the lines of, "If a living wage is a threat to the si sorry, if a living wage is breaking the system, the system deserves to be broken." Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you can see how mm -hmm. it's it's easy to see how uh, movements like uh, Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and various anti-racist activism campaigns. It's easy to them be. We need to be suspicious of them being absorbed into corporate capital, right? Yeah. Through you know Nike, through well, I love like how it's called a diversity yeah. alliance in the yeah. NHL. Yeah. Like you notice the word there, right? Yeah. Diversity. Yeah. Why can't they call it the anti-racist alliance? Because that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. I will say that. If you were to tell me this time last year mm -hmm. that every single game in the NHL, the starting game, mm -hmm. would feature uh, not a commemoration, but some kind of pomp and pageantry yeah. devoted to anti-racism of Black Lives Matter, I would have said, you're fucking kidding me. There's yeah. no fucking way. Yeah. Hockey is one of the more conservative yeah. sporting institutions. And then to have Matt Dumba do the, yeah. the his speech and then mm -hmm. the, the taking a knee, mm -hmm. um, I think it may, it may be cursory, it may yeah. be tokenistic, yeah. but it's a start, right? Yeah. So you can now hold the NHL's feet to the fire and say, "This is what you did. You set up this alliance. What does it mean now?" Yeah. Right. So you you kind of you gain a couple inches. Now you can keep pushing. I, yeah, I'm interested to see whether all of the corporations and the the leagues go past the the token. Right. Right. It might just be that it's fashionable right now. And you know? they'll make more money off of it. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. here's a way for us to gain viewers that yeah. we wouldn't have before. Yeah. But once we gain them, we're not going to change any, right. anything. Right. Right? Yeah. yeah. Like, put, as we know in the university, just because you have a committee doesn't mean 
change is afoot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it is interesting how the players are, are uh, and former players as well. Like I think uh, Evander Kane, Akima Lu, is that his name? Um, are on the, the diversity alliance, whatever it's mm. called. Yeah. It's interesting. And in some cases, I think it's about the NHL just kind of following suit with the other yeah. leagues. Mm. But there are some good signs, I think. There's just things that are unfathom- that would have been unfathomable mm-hmm. a year ago. Yeah. You know? Just it's amazing how, how change can work like that. Yeah. My question is whether it will change what any change will happen at a structural level to move beyond the top earning the top and then yeah. the bottom earning nothing. Yeah. Right? Whether it'll actually translate to more social uh, socialized policies, yeah, which actually yeah. would help a lot more than 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 elevating one person to be right. equally or three people. Yeah, you're so, talking right. about like material changes versus office. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. basically. Because having a, an equally representative board of directors is a good thing. Yeah, but it's n- I would say not as good as just raising the floor, which would help so right. many right, more right, people right. of yeah. color. Yeah, than, of course. Then simply, yeah. you know, beam counting at the highest level. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like the girl boss thing, right? Yeah. Uh, in terms of feminism, so yeah. which isn't really feminism. A girl boss isn't a feminist expression, yeah. at least not the type of feminism I aspire towards. Yeah. So uh, uh, I read another quote, and it was, if you're saying you want to be the girl boss, your next line better be, so I can pay my workers a living wage. If it's not, yeah. you need to question why you want to be a girl boss. So we don't... The whole idea of having more mm-hmm. diversity uh, in the position of CEO doesn't make a kinder, gentler capitalism, does yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, which is precisely what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So I think uh, last question for you. Okay. You have one book for people to read this summer. Doesn't have to be academic. What would you? What would you say? Uh, what would you recommend? Oh shit! It is academic. Yeah, I can't okay. believe I haven't told. I haven't talked about this yet. Uh, the author is Gerald Rounding. Yeah, Rounding rather. It's called uh, "Factories of Knowledge, Industries of Creativity." Mm. And I, I, I don't know if I cry easily when yeah. I read. I've never, <laughs> yeah. I've never cried yeah. at the end of a book on social theory. Yeah, this is a social theory book. It starts with some passages from Kafka. It ends talking about various movements from the Occupy movement. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's interspersed with discussions of the corporatization of the university. There was a guarded, such a guarded hope at the end of it that I, was, I cried at the end of it. It's a quick read. I read it in probably four hours. Oh, nice. It's a very small book. Yeah. But at the end of it, I don't know if it was his writing, if it was the subject matter, if it was just, just this cautious hope at the end of it that I, yeah. I was bawling at the end of it. Yeah. And I was like, what am I, what's going on? I'm crying at the end of something else. So factories of knowledge. That, that would be the one book. Awesome. Yeah. Right. I can't promise everyone will cry, yeah. it, but yeah. I found it really something else. What would be your book recommendation? What would I recommend as a book? Um, so I, I read a lot of um, kind of behavior change books. Okay. Um, I read one this summer. Oh, what was it called? Atomic Habits by oh. James Clear. Okay. And I thought it was a really good one. Just mm-hmm. broke down operant in classic conditioning in a okay. very readable way yeah. and designs a way for people to organize their lives and, and be a little bit more purposeful. Mm. It, it kind of breaks down the idea of without going into it, free will, where people think they have free okay. will. Yeah. And it's, it's basically his idea is that it's easier to change the environment that you're in than it is to change your motivation. Hmm, interesting. Right? So instead, That's like the anti-psych that we were talking about earlier, yeah, right? Yeah. The whole idea of the problem is you. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the main thing is, hey, the problem's not you, the problem's your environment. So become an environmental architect. Sure. Right? Sure. Yeah. So that, and he, it's very simple. And he, and he breaks down the habit loop, which is pretty common in psych literature. But, okay. But he takes the stance that the habit loop is an environmental thing. Hmm. So. It's kind of neat. And he just says, you know, if you want something, make it, you know, make it clear, make it obvious. Right. So if, and Kels does this to me all the time. Right. So if she, if a certain food is going to go bad soon, she yeah. puts it on the table. Okay. And suddenly I'm craving apples. Interesting. Right. Huh. And, and, but if they're over here, or if you look in your, in your 
fridge, right? Yeah. What yeah. food goes bad? The food at the back. Yeah, for me, it's the ones on the top, just right? that sight line. Right? So yeah. if it's not yeah. obvious, you won't do it. Yeah. yeah. So if you're yeah. trying to change your habits in terms of workout, well, before bed, take your workout gear and yeah. put it, uh, yeah. you know, in front of the door. Yeah. Right? So it's, you can't. No, it makes sense. You can't yeah. get away from it. So make yeah. it obvious. Yeah. Uh, try and create cravings, right? So you want to make it have value okay so when i talked about my my spin bike at first i made it not too hard that it wouldn't be right enjoy, and then right. i attached something i already valued to it right so singlet. i when a i singlet. bike yeah when i bike <laughs> i get to wear this sexy singlet and <laughs> and i get to listen to podcasts right so that's when i do my podcast okay right so now when it doesn't have an intrinsic value add an extrinsic and then right. build in right. your intrinsic right. okay. enjoyment afterwards okay. yeah uh, what was else? It talks about different techniques that you can use. There's yep. the, what does he call them? Um, basically, they're behaviors that once you do that, you cannot change them, right? Mm. So mm. create, what are they called? Anyway, so the idea behind this was make the start easy. Yeah. So if you're focusing on working out, yeah. don't forget to focus on doing, you know, a hundred reps of squats, focus on getting to the gym. Okay. Right. Or it's a commitment device. So, right. so my, my yeah. example that I, which isn't new, like we yeah, know this. Yeah. 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 So if I, if I want to work out, well, yeah. and I'm not feeling the workout. What do I do? Yeah. Well, I make a huge pre-workout shake and I down it because it's easy to do. Yeah. But once I down that shake, I have to work out or I'm going to feel sick for three yeah. hours, right? Yeah, so, so it's easy to drink the shake yeah. versus yeah. to work out, right. but just yeah. get the process started yeah. And, yeah. and connect it so that you can't go back, yeah. right? So yeah. I drink my, my pre-workout and I'm either going to sp sit there feeling sick the whole time yeah. or I'm going to go and I'm, right. I'm going to work yeah. out, right? Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And then ways to make it rewarding. So it's a very good read to, to try and get yourself. If you're trying to pick up a new habit or create okay. habits, okay. it's a good way to break down the science and make it very digestible. Yeah. 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 Huh. Interesting. I'll just check it out. Yeah. It was a pleasure having you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for taking for the time to chat. It was a lot of fun. This is my first one I actually did in person. So even though the other ones were very enjoyable, the human aspects. Nice. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Hopefully for the listeners who, you know, you heard some background noise, I'm sorry, but FedEx trucks and whatnot, but I just wanted to meet in person as a social human, so yeah. It's good. Awesome. Good idea.